take some notes in case we need to tweak anything. Okay. Great. Good evening and welcome to the special town meeting pre uh, town meeting information session for the November 13th, 2018 special town meeting. I'm your town administrator, Matt Hansen, um, and I'll be bringing, through, uh, bringing you through the warrant articles here this evening. Uh, traditionally for the pre-town meeting information session, we try and limit it mostly to questions and answers. The intent is really to give you a better understanding of the articles and maybe get some questions out of the way to streamline the town meeting a little bit. This isn't really um, mainly the time for debate. Certainly some questions can you know, lead into that territory a little bit if they're helping you get information. But if your intent is really um, just to have an opinion one way or another and it's not related to gathering more information or, or getting updates, um, it's really better reserved for the actual town meeting when people are going to get to vote on the article. But, uh, you know, I'm still certainly happy to hear what you, what you have to think. Um, we only have 16 articles this evening, so it should be a little bit of a quicker special town meeting and pre-town meeting than you're used to. Happy to report that. And many of them are, are kind of housekeeping articles. They're going to be pretty uh, quick and easy. There are a few that I know you're probably all very interested in and maybe here to hear a lot more on. But we'll start with Article 1. This is a local option for state tax collections. Local options are provisions of mass general law that municipalities can only take advantage of and use after town meeting has voted to accept them and adopted them locally. So this is a local option, Chapter 60, Section 15B, to establish a tax title collections revolving account. Every time we have um, tax bills that are in collections, we generate interest and fees on those. Typically, when those tax bills are paid, that interest and fee just goes back into the general fund. This provision of Mass General Law, law allows us to get a separate revolving account for those fees and interest, allowing us to hire attorneys and uh, use those funds for legal fees that help us collect future delinquent tax bills. So rather than paying legal costs and other costs to track down these tax bills out of the general fund, we can actually use the fees and the interest in the future dedicated specifically for that purpose. Um, so there's no appropriation. Uh, at this time, this is just a provision of mass general law that we'd like to accept. All right. Any questions on that? Okay, great. Just a few quick budget transfers. It is still early in the year. Um, we had a, a little bit of a surplus in our property and liability insurance line item where we're pulling some funding to go towards recreation, salaries and wages, as well as IT software. And then there is just a correction to take some money for indirect costs from the Ambulance Enterprise Fund. That's things like health insurance and whatnot for the firefighters serving uh, in the ambulance and paying back the general fund. Um, so no additional money is being requested here. It's just those transfers within those line items. Um, specifically for recreation, that's bringing our part-time rec director from 32 hours a week up to 40 hours a week. I'm sure most of you are familiar with some of the work that she does, and we also have a few new buildings coming online. Oh, well, specifically the First Parish Meeting House, which is going to have a great partnership with the Old Town Hall um, next spring. When that opens up, um, we're hoping to have one person, the rec director, handling the rental of both of those buildings. Right now, the town administrator's office handles the renting of the Old Town Hall. We don't want those rentals to be in conflict. There's going to be a lot of the same types of activity going on, weddings and bridal showers, and the rec department is going to be housed in the first parish meeting house. So there's going to be some more job responsibilities when that comes online. Uh, in the future, some of that salary will be able to paid, be paid out of the revolving account that's going to fund the Old Town Hall as well as the first parish meeting house. But just to get things started for the first year, we need a small transfer into the recreation salaries line item. The IT software, this is actually really good news. It looks like we're spending more money, but what this really means is that our IT software, this is for permitting software, means our permitting software is getting used more. So it means we're getting charged more for the software from the company, so we need a little bit of a correction mid-year. But at the end of the year, when you look at how much revenue we brought in in permit fees, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a lot higher. Um, we basically pay, um, based on a, a formula based on how many permits we're issuing. Um, so that's it for budget transfers. Any questions at this time? All right, great. Article 3 is an appropriation for legal expenses for fiscal year 2019. Um, the State Cannabis Co Control Commission has come out with some very specific guidelines that any of the money related to cannabis has to be appropriated through town meeting. So in this case, we're not asking for any tax revenue to be go going towards our legal purposes. This is actually bid deposits we collected from the proposed companies 
to help us conduct legal reviews of the adult use marijuana host agreements with the town that the um, subcommittee and the, the Board of Selectmen have negotiated. The state just requires us to take that money, deposit it, and then reappropriate it into our legal account before we can actually expend it. So this money came directly from the companies. This is not a town, um, town tax dollar appropriation. All right. This is a deposit into our special ed stabilization account. Uh, just requires a simple majority uh, to put money into this stabilization account. Uh, would require two thirds to take it out at some point in the future. Um, the school department uh, has agreed that Valley Collaborative reimbursements that are above the amount they anticipated to receive uh, in any given year, if they receive a, a reimbursement that's higher than the amount they anticipated, they'll put it into this stabilization account. And then if at some point they need it in the future mid-year for any unexpected costs, they make a request to the Board of Selectmen and they can access the funds at that time. So this is the, just the school committee making a deposit into that account. Requires your approval. Article 5 is a... Oh, yes. Did you just say that it requires a majority vote, not a two-thirds vote? Yes, so to put the money in only requires a simple majority, but if we take the money out next year or at some time in the future... So that's a, there's a typo here because it says two-thirds vote. Yes, that is. our, our attorneys just caught this okay. on today, actually. Okay. So um, I should have mentioned that as a typo, though, yes. But to take the money out in the future would require two-thirds. So you'll see in your packet, though, it had said two-thirds, but that will only be if we're expending the money in the future. Thank you. Uh, Community Preservation Committee appropriations. This is the only request for CPC at this time. Um, it's a total of $550,000 to complete the first parish meeting house work. Uh, you remember last year, um, town meeting appropriated $1.7 million to renovate the interior. Those designs are complete, and that project is actually out to bid right now. Um, that's the full interior renovation. After that town meeting vote, the Board of Selectmen appointed a subcommittee to um, study the grounds and the walkways and the paths and the parking lot. Uh, you'll remember, if you're familiar with the first parish site, that the entrance and exit is, was really based around two former buildings being there, the Adams Barn and the Surefine building. Those are now gone, so we were able to redesign the entrance as well as the exit and create some more green space, which is great. So we'll show you. Um, here we have some of the cost breakdowns that our consultant at AECOM uh, help the subcommittee with as well as a, a design which I'll show you shortly that's a breakdown of some of the main paving costs and concrete tree costs uh, as well as a few of the other figures um, that make up the total number engineering fees contract administration some lighting some potential engineering and state permitting given we are so close to lower Flint Pond um, I won't read every line item right now I want to get to the uh, the overview here so this is the existing pavement counts about 30,000 square feet um, you'll see oops, you'll see here because we were able to really streamline this really strange entrance and exit on if you're looking at the church on the right hand side that's going to be a simple exit only road onto Kendall so right now everyone will enter and there'll be an entrance and exit off of Middlesex um, the parking lot is being brought down slightly we're preserving the two large trees on the site parking lots just being brought maybe 10, uh, 10 or 15 feet closer to that furthest back tree that's closest to the parking lot. So we gain a little bit of pavement and parking spots on the left side of the church, but the right side of the church, we're reclaiming a lot of green space. So our analysis shows that um, with maximized parking on the site with this design, we're actually reducing the paved area by 14%. Um, so it's going to be great. There's going to be green space both uh, on the old town hall right here that's going to be connected to, with a footbridge. Um, to the other side. And this is the uh, top-down view showing the parking and the entrance and exit as well as some of the, uh, the footpath and the walkways around the church and some of the proposed plantings. Uh, a final design um, will be paid for out of this that will actually help us put our bid documents together. Um, but this is the preliminary design to show the entrance and the exit. And we've run this by MassDOT and they've given us their preliminary approval to go ahead and do the full engineering of the site. Um, and you can see the footbridge here as well. Um, and this is a draft photo of the footbridge from one of the companies we've been getting the cost estimates from. The exact color um, and design hasn't been determined at this time, but that's a, an example of what we intend it to look like, about uh, five to six feet wide, about 65 feet long. That will connect the parking lot at the First Parish Meeting House and those green spaces to the Old Town Hall to make it feel more like one parcel. Um, so um, that's the main request for the CPC this year. No question. 
and that will essentially complete the project. We have partnered with um, the State Complete Streets Program with $400,000 that's actually going to pay for some of the sidewalk work on this side as well as uh, the mouth to the new exit only road <coughs> as well as <coughs> Justin in our office. Um, ran that um, grant program that actually connected donations from the community. It was a matching grant with the state. We raised over $30,000. That's going to help support this project as well. So we pulled in multiple funding sources to help make it as affordable as possible um, to the residents. Article 6 is a borrowing to purchase the Tingsboro Country Club. Um, we have made some updates to this presentation since you may have seen it at the um, golf course public information session that was provided uh, a week or two ago. Um, Selectman Rowe may partner with me to, to help give this presentation. Um, I don't know if you want to come up at this time or if you want me to go through some of the first slides and step in. Okay, great. Um, since this is it's quite lengthy, um, I may go through it a little bit quickly, but really feel free to stop me at any time if you have any questions. This is a top-down overview of the multiple parcels that really make up the Tingsboro Country Club. There's a large 54-acre parcel at the top, two smaller parcels on the south side of Sherburn that make up about 30 acres, and there are a few houses that have some, some easements and accesses that are right in between the two uh, large parcels there. Uh, in full disclosure, there's an overview of a few options that were considered. Right now on the warrant, the only option that's moving forward for consideration at this special town meeting is the option to purchase uh, the Tingsboro Country Club. However, if for some reason that didn't move forward, there are some options that could be considered at a future date. That would involve a potential rezoning for a 55 and over um, age-restricted housing development. The Toll Brothers have two options that they're considering right now, as well as there's the option that if the town does nothing, it could just be con turned into a conventional subdivision around 37 uh, homes approximately. So that's really a high-level overview of all of the options. Um, the only one that's being considered and voted on is the option to purchase it at this time, but we did want to make you aware of the other potential options so you could make the best, most educated decision. The overview of the Toll Brothers proposal, that's what really spearheaded um, this. We were expecting if at some point we received a bona fide offer for the property, uh, the Board of Selectmen was going to have to make a decision about whether they would exercise their right of first refusal. This is in Chapter 61 right now, which means they pay a reduced tax burden, but the town has the option to purchase it if they um, want to go to sell it for development. And that's what um, started all of these discussions. This was their initial proposal for 204 age-restricted units it was going to take up basically the, the entire site. Um, they provided us with some slides and some financials. And this is an overview of what their single homes looks like. They're, this is also their proposed carriage home. They have some two and three unit carriage homes. And they have some proposed amenities. These are amenities really for their, their neighborhood residents, the 200 uh, homeowners who live there, a pool, um, bocce ball courts, pickleball courts, and a clubhouse. Uh, another option for consideration potentially, um, this would have to be sometime in the future like the May town meeting, would be a 66 unit, 55 plus deed restricted housing uh, on 31 acres. It would generate significantly less tax revenue obviously than if they built 204 units, but that would leave approximately two thirds or 61 acres of the property available for open space or for recreation or for potentially a six plus whole golf course. That's what this would look like. The light green area here, this is a proposal they just sent us today You know, for some potential consideration if the town wanted some green space but wanted some development on the site. This is the next smallest development they feel like they could build. This would allow the town to purchase approximately 60 acres and run maybe a six plus hole golf course, maybe do some reconfiguration and get a few more holes and do more of a three par course. Um, but it would take up most of the wooded area that's on the site right now and it would bump into a couple of the holes on the northern side. Um, that sort of final option is just if the town does nothing, the owner can move forward and do a standard subdivision. It would be approximately 37 lots. We did pay to have an analysis done. Tramwell Crow came up with 37 lots. Um, our peer review engineer estimated 36 lots, so we think that's pretty close in the ballpark. This is an example of what that could look like. So our town uh, peer review engineer put this together, and this is what we were able to base some of our financial information off. So this is something that wasn't presented um, in as much detail at the last meeting. Um, you want me to go forward? <coughs> yeah. Sure. There, 
There actually is a, another option. The, the owners could uh, potentially take the property out of Chapter 61 by paying the back taxes. Um, they would have to run the golf course for another year. Um, but then at that time, the town would not have an option, the first option to buy the property, and they could sell it off to a developer and it would develop. So th that's actually a fifth option that we'll have to add to the presentation. All right. So to help the town make this decision, uh, we put together some information that we thought um, well, it's not directly related, would help you make your decision as far as why the town may want to either purchase the golf course and help it remain as open space. So in this presentation, there are some other major topics of interest within town, noteworthy commercial developments, Tingsboro's recent financial successes, some reasons to purchase the Tingsboro Country Club, the funding options, and the in information on town-owned golf courses in our region. So... If you don't see the funding options right away, we want, you let, want to let you know that we do come to them towards the end, but we're going to provide you with some backup information first. So two major areas of interest in town that have been discussed recently are the condition of our roads and residential developments. So regarding the condition of roads, uh, the Board of Selectmen and Administration have taken some proactive steps over the past few years to make some improvements to our roads. Uh, in particular, the town has accepted over 90 roads in the last five years, which has increased our Chapter 90 funding dramatically from about 270000 a year to over 440000 per year. And we received um, an additional funding allotment from the state this year of almost $80,000. <clears> the town also supported a $1.6 million debt exclusion specifically for road paving. Um, we completed a pavement management plan to help us better understand our roadway funding needs, including over $30 million if we were to pave all of our roads all at once, which isn't realistic, but it helped us as a, for planning purposes. It's a great planning tool. In addition, um, at this previous annual town meeting, we added $50,000 to highway department budget for the first time specifically for road paving, and we'll be able to expand that hopefully in future years with additional tax revenue. So we'll be able to supplement the Chapter 90 funding so we're not relying solely on the state. So that was a proactive step supported by the Board of Selectmen in town meeting this past May. <laughs> And then we'll also have the ability moving forward next year to dedicate a large portion of the estimated $750,000 in annual cannabis host community agreement funding towards road improvements as well. So you'll likely see that in an upcoming town meeting. Regarding recent residential developments, um, 10 years ago, Tingsboro was close to 3% of homes deed restricted affordable per the state's recommendations. That's why there were really a litany of 40B projects you've seen over the past few years but what that's done is it's helped the town achieve a rate of 11% deed-restricted affordable housing um, through several large residential projects. Um, due to this reading, Tingsboro now has the ability to turn away future 40B projects that are not in the town's interests. Um, we're currently nearing completion of a new housing production plan, which will continue to protect the town from 40B projects for the next five years. Um, <clears throat> 120 home ownership units are currently under construction at Tingsboro Crossing, with approximately 40 built to date. 66 additional rental units are permitted at Tingsboro Commons, and there are a few other potential projects, the 192 units permitted at 50 Westford Road and 96 units at Flint's Corner, and then there is the potential of the Tingsboro Country Club 204 units, but obviously if the town agrees to purchase the Country Club, that would come off the potential list. <coughs> So what does all of this mean? The current population is about 12,000, but if all of those proposed projects move forward, the town will be a little bit more built out, closer to 13,000 within the next three years. There's also been some noteworthy commercial developments we'd like to highlight. The Citizens Energy Solar Project on the Charles George landfill brought in approximately $700,000 in back taxes and reduced the town building electric bills by 25% in most cases for most of our larger users. There was also $355,000 in proceeds from the surplus land sale at Five Industrial Way um, that was sold to Chumsford Crane. The land was actually taken by tax title over 20 years ago. We resold it and made a, a very large profit. The Tingsboro Sports Center, Modern Auto, Mass Crane, Top Line Granite, New England Beekeeping, Carlisle Honey, and Best Friends Pet Care have all s expanded here in Tingsboro with very large commercial uh, projects. We're very happy about that. And there was the passage of the Phase Two sewer project, which is, has unlocked a few hundred acres of vacant or underutilized land, business and industrial land on Middlesex Road, and nearly 100 acres of industrial land owned by Brox Industries on both sides of Kendall Road. That project is expected to be up and running in uh, two years. 
Some other Tingsboro financial successes we want to note in the last three years, 2016, 17, and 18, our new growth has been six, uh, steadily increasing. Um, our uh, stabilization funds have increased dramatically since fiscal year 2010 as far as a percentage of our operating budget goes. 2010, they were down to 2%, which is really a dangerously low level if you have another bad year. Um, we wouldn't have had a lot of places to draw additional funding from. This current fiscal year, we're in fiscal year 19, we're up to 6.74%. And with some new uh, free cash that we're et estimating to certify and put towards our stabilization accounts uh, in May, that number could be as high as 8.5%. Uh, the DOR recommends really between 5 and 10%. We'd like to be at least 7.5%. 8.5% would be better. If we could make it all the way to 10%, that would really help us towards a AAA bond rating, which is the highest rating we could achieve. So we're, we're well on our way to that. Um, <clears throat> speaking of bond ratings, um, for the first time in, in, in actually the history of the town, as far as we're aware, we received a double A positive bond rating, which is the second highest bond rating the town can achieve other than a triple A bond rating. Um, some of the things that the bond rating agencies noted was our very strong local economy, strong budgetary performance, our strong budget flexibility, as well as a low debt position. We've also collected real estate back taxes and interest totaling $693,000 since we brought on our new appointed uh, full-time uh, tax collector. We've made some great strides there in tax collections. We've also integrated a long-term capital improvement plan with multi-year budget forecasts to better predict budget challenges and strategically plan, plan for the future. And the assistant town administrator is going to be working with the capital asset management committee to make some additional improvements this year to continue to improve that process. And the town recently also adopted an OPEB funding plan. Those are other post-employee benefits, retiree health insurance benefits. Um, we adopted a plan for that that helped us reduce our assessment that we get. We basically have an assessment that dings our bond rating. We're able to reduce that assessment by $6 million by putting a funding plan in place. So this is where we get into the considerations for purchasing the Tingsboro Country Club. As noted in our previous master plan, there are six large acres, uh, uh, areas of open space that were important for the town to protect, two of those being our golf courses, and one of them was actually already developed, the Maple Ridge area. So preserving the two golf courses was a major point throughout the master plan. And Tingsboro's appeal to current and future residents. Um, Tingsboro has this great small town character with a rural suburban image, large house lots, low density, low population, and open space. And 255 plus condos in a residential area is a bit, bit inconsistent with that rural appeal. Um, potential future developments, as we noted, are already potentially in development. 50 West Road Apartments, Flint's Corner Apartments, uh, additional condos on, under construction already on Middlesex Road. We touched upon that at the beginning. Then there's also a 25-acre parcel on Pawtucket Boulevard, which is listed for $3 million. And that's zoned for R3 already, which is the highest density residential zone. That's half-acre lots. Um, so that could be a potential future development in the near future. What would purchasing the Tingsboro Country Club do? It would help alleviate that current residential boom. Some considerations when thinking about whether to purchase the Tingsboro Country Club, new revenue and or use options. There is the lease potential to lease a portion of the property for a new function hall and a restaurant. We could utilize a request for proposal process to identify interested business owners who would invest in the property to bring additional uses and revenue into the property. We could subdivide off the two existing residential properties for resale uh, to reduce the borrowing amount or to put money in a rainy day, in a rainy day fund if we needed it for the future. Um, there are some additional ongoing operation and funding considerations. Will the town use a management company or town staff? Some towns do it differently. Um, there's potentially capital improvement costs that we'll need to consider and annual management fees and salary costs. And if there are any potential operating deficits, how would we manage that? So the cost of purchase, which you've seen this number um, brought up, estimating between four and a half to five million. Mind you that the borrowing is for up to five million or a lower amount, um, but we like to be conservative when we ask for requests at town meeting. We anticipate an interest rate of approximately three and a half percent. Hopefully interest rates won't go up in the next few months. I know they're considering it. That could bump it closer to the four range, but it wouldn't have that large of an impact. If we were to borrow that money for 30 years, it would be approximately 50 to $56 per year on the average household. It was brought up that we could borrow that money for a shor shorter time period, and it would reduce the interest cost, but it would make a larger um, annual impact on the average homeowner. 
And, um, you know, the Board of Selectmen wants to be mindful of that, and they would have to make a decision in the future as far as what the exact borrowing term would be. But those are some of the things that they're considering. There are back taxes that would be paid as far as, um, as part of any transition to this property from a golf course to anything else we mentioned. That's approximately $38,000. That could help off offset that borrowing as well. So the cost estimates that we are looking at now, uh, on the lower end for raw land could be anywhere from $60,000 for the 37 lots, would, which would put you at $2.2 million, up to as high potentially as $91,000 per lot for the 37 lots. That's closer to $3.3 million. So there's <clears throat> our current estimates show about a million dollar swing there. Um, <clears throat> our Assessors have given us the $91,000 number, noting that that's how they would appraise this raw land uh, in its current form, noting that that's really a highest and best use. They had a number that's lower to 70, but, um, <clears throat> and some builders have given us a number that's uh, closer to the 60,000 per lot number. Um, the Board of Selectmen will make a decision if uh, they receive the approval from town meeting for the exact process they want to go through to have the land uh, appraised or assessed before any potential sale. The state offers a couple different options on exactly how you do that. Um, but then there are also some additional cost considerations that the selectmen would have to consider as far as a negotiation. So this isn't just buying a couple parcels of land. Um, um, there's also the consideration to prevent development. There's a value to preserving open space, and the state does give you some flexibility to uh, negotiate a price that could potentially be a little higher or lower, depending on a factor like that. There's also the value of um, the golf course equipment. If we do want the town chooses to run it as a golf course, um, we would have to pay for that uh, equipment in addition. These cost estimates are just based on the land alone. Um, the Tingsboro Country Club actually has a license to irrigate with water from the Merrimack River, which I guess is a unique and expensive item. Uh, Vesper Country Club, I think, also has one. Um, so that's unique and has value. Um, there's also the consideration for participation and training from the current owners during the transition phase that could be considered into a final negotiated deal. Um, there's a potential need for contingency for any required capital upgrades or operating losses in the first few years and a very small amount for legal fees. So we wanted to show you what we believe the estimates are just for the land itself, but also some of the additional costs that the selectmen are going to have to consider, which is the reason why I think they'd like the total authorization to be a little bit higher than the raw land value. But ultimately, um, it would be up to the board to negotiate that final price. And, uh, so the funding options, just to clarify. Yeah, uh, yeah. Can we go back to that slide? Yes. Um, I think we were missing a couple line items. Uh, sure, we can add some. Uh, the, the cost to build a golf course on that. Oh, right. Land. Yep, that was on the other slide, and, sorry. Uh, also, the, we have the, um, the clubhouse. And the clubhouse, yeah. You can come on up. We consulted with Vespa Country Club and um, came up th that potentially if you were going to build a golf course on rod land, that it could be anywhere from a million and a half to two million dollars to, to build that course. Uh, so that it, we, when we're looking at trying to um, appraise the value of the property, it's a unique property where we're actually probably buying that to preserve the land and open space and, pre and prevent the housing. But um, we're, um, we, so we have to take a, a raw land approach, but also a business approach as well. Um, we also have the revenues. Did we have the revenues from the, that, that's coming up on the next slide. Okay, so um, there, is, there is some added value with how much it would cost to put that golf course, which is already there. The land has been improved by the golf course, and it does have a, a clubhouse that was, I think we had a value of $250,000 on that. So it, considering that, it, can, it could potentially bring that, that appraisal value um, uh, well, well over $5 million. Great. It's been a work in progress. You're our test case here, so we like having this before town meeting, so everything can be nice and perfect for them. All right, so uh, option one, this is the option that's actually on the warrant. This is a Prop 2.5 debt exclusion override. So what this means is we're required a two-thirds vote for the borrowing at the town meeting, and then it also requires a majority vote at a townwide ballot in May, which would be the May 2019 election. Uh, this provides the most long-term flexibility for the property. 
If we were to consider one of the other options, such as option number two, which is a partial Prop 2.5 debt exclusion, um, the town could have considered borrowing some money through the CPC or using some CPC funds or, or other funds um, to reduce the amount of the borrowing. But anytime you use CPC funds, it adds restrictions to the property, specifically conservation restrictions. And as we noted in some of our, our revenue options, it's going to include possibly carving off small portions of the property, possibly leasing portions, portions of the property for a restaurant or function hall. If we were to use CPC funds, it might limit our ability to have flexibility with the, the property in the future. Um, so the option that provides the most long-term flexibility is option one, which is on the warrant. Um, but we did want to make you note that make a note that those other funding options were considered. So um, we'll get into some of the financials very shortly on the Tingsboro Country Club, but we wanted to note two of the other regional town-owned golf courses that we looked at and what some of their funding mechanisms were and their revenue. Um, the Chumster Country Club and the Groton Country Club were actually both town-owned nine-hole golf courses. Chumsford um, received theirs through eminent domain for about a million dollars. Got to remember that was back in 1995, and that's only a 31-acre club. They manage that by Sterling Golf Management, and the fees cover the management costs and the general upkeep, and the town remains responsible for some major capital improvements, but we'll get into how they fund that shortly. Groton Country Club was purchased for almost $2 million back in 1989. That's 113 acres, uh, very similar in size to the Tingsboro Country Club. That's actually staffed with town employees. They have had some occasional losses covered by the general fund up to $100,000, but we'll show you here that has turned around a little bit in the last few years. Um, they were investing, I understand, a lot in their country club for a few years to make some capital improvements, and you can see that um, really hit their bottom line. They did have some pretty significant losses. Um, the last two years, 2016 and 2017, they came pretty close to breaking even. They actually did break even one year. Uh, this year, they did have a couple unexpected capital costs, which put them in the red about um, thirty dollars to $40,000, um, not, not a terribly significant amount. Um, and again, that's run with town staff. Chumsford Country Club, on the other hand, Sterling Golf Management um, manages the club, all the daily operations, and they keep 90% of the revenue. So there's no flat fee that the town has to pay them. Uh, the better the country club does, the better Sterling Golf Management does, but there's also less, ri less risk to the town. Um, the town receives a minimum of $30,000 per year, which is 10% of all the revenue up to $300,000. The golf course typically brings in a little bit more than, than $300,000 a year in revenue. Then they also do get some additional revenue from renting, um, renting their clubhouse. Um, last year's lease payment to the town was 33687 and then they also received an overall benefit uh, totaling $40,000 because of the pub rentals. Um, that money, the town puts it into a enterprise fund so they can spend it on capital improvements. So uh, this year they had 119,000 in that stabilization fund. So town meeting this October approved spending $86,000 uh, to reconstruct the ninth green. That'll bring that balance down to $33,000. So that's an example of how they manage their larger capital costs. They don't take any money out for the general operating budget. They keep it in account specifically for the golf course. Um, so how does that line up with the financial information we've got from the Tingsboro Country Club? Um, we don't have our current staffing and budgeting, but um, we have reached out to the current owners, and in their highest and best years, they've reported four hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars per year in revenue. In their lowest revenue year, uh, three hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars, which was actually this year, considering the poor weather and news of a potential sale, we believe both those factors hurt their business. So they were down pretty significantly this year, but they're usually up closer to, to four hundred thousand. That's very much in line with certainly Chumsford's revenue as well as the historic revenue that uh, revenue and expenses that Groton runs off of. So we do believe that the Tingsboro Country Club uh, has the revenue potential similar to other town-owned golf courses to be mostly self-sustaining. Um, anything on that? I missed Rick. That's my last slide that I have at this time. Okay. That was a lot of information. Take it in. Uh, I just have one comment about evaluation. Um, if we're going to, I don't think we can evaluate the breaking it into 36 or 37 lots and the cost for that and use that evaluation and also add on to that the cost of making a golf course. 
because if if you're going to do that then you have to put in what would the cost of a golf what what is the value of that as a golf course and i think that's closer to 2 million so i just don't think i don't think we can keep adding multiple things onto this cost to be fair i think that what you had on there was was correct but adding the cost of creating a golf course out of plain land then you have then you would have to add the uh, what the value of it is just as a golf course so if, if we're going to do that we need to we need to show both for everybody okay thanks I'm wondering why the town can't take it out, take the funding for this out of its current revenue stream, instead of going back to the taxpayer. Sure. Uh, rogue. I I have a hard time believing the town is rogue because if you you mentioned earlier all of the additional businesses. I mean, all you have to do is drive around the town. You see all of the businesses that have come in. You've reassessed the property values on homes. Um, mm -hmm. I know my taxes last year and this year it, it have gone up 17% on just my house. Okay. So this to me is a big deal if you keep yep. passing costs on to the taxpayers. Sure. Um, do, you want, sure. do you want to start or do you want me to? Sure. Uh, yeah. So as far as funding it out, out of our, our general fund, um, the, 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 there could be a proposal that maybe fund some, uh, some of it out of the general fund and maybe some from the taxpayers. One of the things that I would say that our estimate, when we were estimating $56 on the average tax bill, uh, I think that would go down once we sold the two houses, it would bring the sale of the property lower. So that would significantly drop that cost. And as we are, if we continue to have the additional growth with the proposed units that if they do get built and we, we will have more units to spread that money out over uh, more tax bills. So I think I, I don't even see that being the $56 on the average tax bill. I see it more 40 to $45. If there was a proposal to pay some of that with, with town money, I, I, don't, I don't know, we, we, our budget is pretty tight. We we the school committee last year uh, on their proposal. What, what did they ask for a five hundred thousand dollar increase? Yeah. Last year and 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 we we limited them to a three hundred or or they wanted. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't have the exact, yeah, numbers. Have the exact numbers, but I'm I'm going to say that we cut two two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand out of the school budget uh, last year. There's positions in town that we have not had such as a town planner, such as a town engineer, such as a um, superintendent of highway that we haven't had, and those are positions that we need. We've been slowly bringing them on. Uh, we've seen some good uh, new growth in town to help us. One of the things we see in our budget is the only increase that we get in our budget is from the increased taxes in Tingsboro. The state doesn't fund us any more money. As a matter of fact, it, when, I, when we get level funded from the state, I consider that a tax cut because our, our bills go up every year. The cost of, the cost of uh, our employees, the cost of uh, insurance, uh, it, particularly health insurance, those costs go up every year significantly. And we have to pay for those costs through the revenue that we bring in through, through town tax dollars and not through the state. So um, it would be, not to say that it couldn't happen, we have other things that we wanna do in town. We want a new public safety building. We wanna redo our, our middle school, uh, which was our original high school that was built over 60 years ago. Uh, that needs uh, that needs work. So there's a lot of things that we want to do in town. This is about land preservation. We don't feel comfortable about just taking the whole thing out of our budget. It would it would it would cause stress in those areas. So we we feel that the cost of preserving land, if it's if the people again, we showed that one of our concerns was how much building we're doing in town. In order to stop that building or or slow it down it would have to come out of the, most likely have to come out of the taxpayer's pocket if that's what they want. And if you have anything else to add? Yeah. No, I, I, I don't wanna make it a budget debate session. Um, I, I recognize that somewhere around 80% of the town's income is from 
uh, the residents. Um, however, I do want to make sure that you consider um, every option to include the existing revenues before you come back to the taxpayers because th this may at some point become self-sustaining um, based on the data you showed, um, the potential business. But, uh, you know, all of the other things that you mentioned that the town wants to do, that's, that's a bill. That bill falls on, on all of us consumers. And as you said, your town employees' life insurance and medical insurance goes up, our insurance goes up. And, you know, our, our pay rate of increase often does not keep pace with the taxes in the towns. And Tingsboro, I'm sure you know, has one of the highest tax rates in Middlesex County. So I'm very concerned about, um, you know, the, the, the trend and, and you keep coming back to, to the residents for additional funding. So I'll leave it at that. And I just, um, it would be nice t during the town meeting if we could see something um, where you have actually show us where you've explored other options within the existing revenue stream. Sure, um, I can I can certainly uh, add a little bit to the the slide here about the cost of purchase and what that would mean for the annual budget. Um, it, I know we have a forty million dollar budget, and it it may seem like it's an easy thing to just fit something within the budget. But what we what we tend to run into is this past year, for example, um, we have a little bit less uh, than a million dollars of additional revenue each year. Just from our departments alone, we had about a million and a half dollars worth of requests. So that budget that we brought to town meeting in May, we had already told our, our departments, our police department, our highway department, our school department, we had chopped a half million out of that before it even got to you. And so j most of our budget uh, is also fixed cost. It's, it's salaries and it's benefits. And the, the cost of those increasing every year or the contractual raises as well as the health insurance, which we don't have any control over, um, eats up the entire prop two and a half increase that you get. So those additional, uh, we have to hope that our new growth covers um, our contractual raises and other things. So to take the annual debt payment of $250,000 and stick that in in one year would be difficult. However, your point is well taken that if some of these projects we have in the pipeline um, are built in the next two to three years, it would give us a significant um, it would give us a significant boost to our new growth, which could help offset some of this. The question then would just become, um, again, is it applied to this so we don't have to borrow for this, or is it towards the next big project like a school or public safety building or you know our building repairs? Um, so we could there's a chance we could fit this in the budget, but it would maybe just push out the next project, and that's the that's the consideration we would have to make. Yeah, no, I understand it's about prioritizing. I mean, we all do yeah. that every day. You know, we all do that every day with our with our home uh, okay. home budgets. It's just that um, uh, it, it seems that this town is continually um, in its its desire to improve and grow and uh, sending you know the cost of that uh, down to the taxpayers in the town. So we have a fine line too, right. and just like the town. Mm -hmm. Everyone's personal budget has has a bottom line where it's going to break. Sure. So, like I said, you know, just from a personal perspective, my taxes between last year and what they're projecting next year have gone up 17 oh. percent. And I'm on a fixed income, retired. I mm -hmm. there's only so much I can do. Right. So I am very concerned about the trend. I'm sure a lot of people are. Right. So I'll leave it at that. I don't want to take everyone's sure. No, that's fine. Thank you for the question. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we can hear that. Yeah, that's good. Hi. Um, I, I think it sounds like a wonderful thing, the open space, but we're not a rich community. Um, as you were saying, everybody was saying, we got all these things coming up. What happens? Are you going to float a bond if something happens at the middle school? Um, Four or five million dollars, I, I just don't see it. And the Troll Brothers um, proposal, I was a little bit excited about it at first because there's a lot of people in this town that have raised their kids here and their houses are too big. And we thought, gee, this might be something nice. Now, you start out, they ask for the moon, and then you negotiate down. It wouldn't end up being 200 and something units. You could negotiate it down. You could probably negotiate some open space donated. 
and I haven't heard anything about what the tax revenue would be from um, the over 55 high-end condos. No impact on the town. No impact on the schools. No impact on the rubbish, pay, plowing the roads. And, and I would imagine it would be, unlike all the houses that are being built with tons of children, I would imagine that it would be a good amount of tax money. Now, if we were a wealthy community and we had tons of industry, I know we've had a lot of building, but they don't pay big taxes like big industry does. If we had that, then you could say, oh, we have all this money. Let's save that golf course. I mean, we can't afford to save that golf course. We can't even hire extra teachers. We're like right to the bone, doing a wonderful job with what we have. But it's just... All of a sudden now, it seemed like there seemed to be a decent proposal that we could talk about, and then now, all of a sudden, the town meeting's gonna vote on borrowing five, four or five million dollars and running a golf course. I don't, I mean, we've got, you know, a, building a function hall. I thought that's what the uh, old town hall and the, the parish meeting was gonna be for. But anyway, just very concerned. Thank you, and, and thank you for your comments, and I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people that, that feel the same way that you do, and this is why um, it's being proposed as a debt exclusion, uh, but then again, we'll go back to the slide where uh, there's a, the, the two main concerns that we hear in town are roads and residential building. Now, we have two permitted projects whether they'll get built or not remains to be seen. But we have two permitted projects that we we showed on the screen that it could be potentially built in the next couple of years, 50 Westford Road and Flint's Corner. And then we showed all the building that's going up on Middlesex Road uh, that's currently under construction. So with with the combination of, of those projects, you're looking, you're looking at 450 units being in town. So I, I sat down with Toll Brothers when they came in and um, they talked about the golf course and I, I initially thought, I said, I don't think the town could afford it. I don't think we have enough money in CPC. I didn't consider uh, the option of a, a debt exclusion and what that, how that would impact the town. Um, but the first thing I asked the Toll Brothers was, can, can we downsize this? 204 units is a lot. Can you do it at 150? I was told, absolutely not. We cannot do that. And that's why you see the proposal going at 66 units and, and, and as a joint purchase with the town. But this is what we're going to run into. If this project, the Toll Brothers project, goes to town, there'll have to be a zoning change. And that zoning change will have to pass by two-thirds vote. And there'll be a lot of people in town that will feel that that creates too much traffic, it's too much residential use, and they'll vote that down. It, potentially, maybe not. So that, that's the option that, that might fail. It comes down to we're a small community, big parcels are leaving our town, we only have one opportunity to, to, sa to save them. So that's why we bring it up. We need the discussion. We need to have that discussion at town meeting to see what the people feel like doing. And here, here's a property that can be used recreationally in the summertime as a golf course, in the wintertime with, with cross-country skiing and snowshoeing and, and, and sledding. And, and again, alleviate some of the traffic that we would see at the bridge, some of the overbuilding that we're seeing in town. Um, and I, I do appreciate the impact. I feel every community is having an increase in population. Not I feel, I know. Every community is having an increase in population. Um, Tingsboro is always going to be the smallest town in this area next to Dunstable. Every town is bigger than we are. Uh, even the, the towns over the border, Hudson, Pelham, they're building more than we are. Um, I feel we'll, we'll look at the numbers on our tax rates. Uh, I, I think our, our taxes go up just as equally as other towns. 
I don't think we have as much building as other towns. I've seen the, the increase in population in Westford and Drake it, uh, that have gone up a lot higher than ours. We're at 12,000 now. Again, 13, 14,000 in, you know, in the next five years. We're, we're just trying to manage our growth. But once the house gets on, houses get built on that golf course, it, that's the end of it. It'll, it'll be gone. Um, and whether it's going to be um, 200 units, 66 units, 30 houses, once those are, are built there, it's gone. Um, and I feel like it's been a good recreational space for our town for the last 90 years. And um, if, if we feel that we want to make an investment uh, in the town and we feel we can afford it, uh, then we're going to save it for the next 100 or 200 years. And um, I just want to clarify, I, I skipped over it briefly in the presentation. We did include the estimated tax revenue for their 204 unit proposal um, in the 1.4 to $1.7 million range, as well as the, the smaller proposal, which knocked it down to about um, 634000 uh, range. So it was included in there. We are trying to be as, as transparent as possible. I must have just not said it uh, when I was going through, so I apologize. <clears throat> Hi, Matt. Hello. Hi, Rick. Um, <clears throat> so, number one, thank you. Uh, thank you for this presentation. It gives us a lot more information than I, than I had uh, previously, and uh, I know you've put a lot of work into this. Um, my initial impression is 204 units is way too much, uh, and I know that's what Toll Brothers originally came in with, and um, I'm glad you pushed back on that. That just doesn't make sense. It's a beautiful site. We all know that. I live on that side of the river, so I go by it all the time. Um, but I was intrigued a little bit. And again, I don't know enough about it. You guys have been involved in the negotiations uh, with the 66 units. Mm -hmm. And one question is, did Toll Brothers present that or was that Tremel Crow? No, I, I misspoke. Okay. Toll, Toll Brothers presented that. Okay. Um, that brings them underneath the threshold to have to tie into sewer, which is a four or five million dollar cost to them. So okay. they can either do a 66 or a real big one. That's kind of how. Okay. They and that cost I heard was two and a half million dollars, more or less, the permit fees to tie into the sewer and the water and all that. Or. So, so what they're saying is, with the 66 units, they could do a private septic system in there, okay. and, and so that's the most that they can put in there allowable with a private okay. septic system. We would still. Uh, and on that proposal, we would still have to buy half ha half the cost of the I project. That. I saw so, that. So 60 so some gonna, odd acres you'd buy? So it, it's like it would cost you $20 to buy half of it and $40 to buy the whole thing. Um, and then, again, if you bought half of it and allowed the 66 units, I don't think many people play six-hole you know, six golf courses. Uh, we would have to try to build another three holes and this is where the cost of building a golf course comes in you know it, it we would have to take that and if it cost you know a million and a half to build nine holes how much would it cost us another five hundred thousand to build three holes and you'd kind of have to cram them in there um so that that's a kind of a different proposal yeah, no I get, I get that and the the shaded area matt is that where the 66 would go yeah the lightly okay. shaded area is where they're proposing the 66 units, or they would they would propose that next year. Okay, and and t under that scenario, Rick, the town would then be responsible for all of the darker green area and buy that. Yes. Okay. Uh, a comment on what you just said, Rick. Uh, one, I'm not sure we need to buy property for a golf course. I'm just not a big fan. I'm a municipal manager. Yeah. I'm just not a big fan of that. Um, I'm more in favor of if we're going to buy some property, buy it as open particularly the lower part of it, where the clubhouse is and that type of thing. That's a gorgeous piece of property. Um, and perhaps if we arrive at a, at a compromise going forward and somebody builds 60 or 70 units in the back part and the town wants to buy some property at a lesser price than three million buck, uh, five million bucks, you might get some support from people who, as my wife just said, I'm looking to downsize. I want to stay here. I mean, I really love this town. And if I can buy a four or five hundred thousand dollar unit 
some of the single ones that they put in, the du du duplexes. Or, I'd probably do that, sell my house and get into something reasonable, smaller, self-sustaining, which is the important part to me. And to the comments about the taxes, you know, six hundred, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars a year, with literally no impact on a town except for traffic. I get that. Um, that's not a bad return for somebody that's going to build some units that I think are necessary. Uh, because, as my wife said, we've got a lot of friends my age in town who are looking for some place to live. We don't want to live in a condo that they're building all over town. We want to live in something, and I've dealt with Toll Brothers. I don't care if it's Toll Brothers or Trammell Crow. Or Those people would do it right if you keep their feet to the fire. And it will be a benefit, I think, ultimately to the town. So that's a comment. And again, thank you for all of this information. There's a lot there. So. Thank, thank you. One of, the, one of the things that we voted on on our last selectman's meeting, there's a proposal for to rezoning for age restricted 55 and older such as they were wanted to propose for this parcel we felt that 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 zoning uh, bylaw was not ready and it also probably should go into an annual town meeting but one of the things that we would look at is try to identify parcels where that could go um, maybe smaller parcels um, a, a small subdivision because we hear um, as you stated that there's a lot of older people that might be looking to downsize and would <laughs> right it, a lot of a lot of people that want to downsize um, and uh, leave their bigger home where we raised our children um, and and look for uh, a smaller self-sustaining property so that is something that we're working on um, I know that this might be appealing and a lot of units but again for for, for other people in, who've lived in town for and, and, or uh, have moved into town and, and have either they played there as a young kid or their kids have played there, but it's a recreational uh, and almost like a, we have the signature of our bridge. Um, these properties were in a master plan that said try to preserve these properties. Um, it, it's important to retain that small town character and if we keep building all residentials on our big parcel we're gonna lose that that small town character we're gonna lose that recreational space um, and I think there's there's a lot of things you can see that we what we've done with Old Town Hall what we've done with the meeting house what we're attempting to do in the center of town we're really trying to build a community and I think this is a piece of the puzzle where you try to build a community and invest something in your community um, that everybody can share I think there's community events uh, that we could participate in here just like we can in the center of our town can you go back to the other slide it was so I want to make sure I got this right if the Which slide one? where it says the debt annual payment is two hundred and fifty seven thousand something yes what does that mean does that mean so that's the annual payment on the borrowing that the town would have to pay we would pay that two hundred and fifty seven thousand dollars through a prop two and a half override so every homeowner would give us the extra fifty six dollars per year okay that's um, what I thought so the other slide where it shows the Groton numbers or Groton numbers? Okay, this is actual operating expenses, revenue and expenses versus the cost of purchase. So this is separate. Um, so these revenue and expense numbers we were trying to show you, they're similar to Chumsford. Groton's a little higher. Chumsford's around 300000 per year. And then Tingsboro's been in the three to 500000 per year range. These are operating expenses. They just happen to be very similar to the annual cost of buying the golf course but they're unrelated well that's fine because well you have revenue so if Tingsboro's bringing in on the low south th side 327 go back to the Groton Groton whatever it is yeah yeah expenses 450,000 so yep. none of the revenues match up even on the low side although Groton Groton is the closest in population at 11,364 so I'm not seeing how that actually works. How, how are we expecting to see revenue if we're looking at it through conservative eyes, revenue that actually benefits the town? 
Oh, um, I don't. I don't think we're expecting the country club to be a big revenue generator. Our our hope would be that through good management, they made a management change in 2015 or 2016. Here, they took a sort of a losing club and brought it more in line with one that comes close to breaking even. I think our hope would be that it would break even. The Chelmsford Country Club tends to to break even. <coughs> Um, other than they had a very large unforeseen capital expense for their clubhouse, which the general government paid for back in 2013 or so. But other than that, the last uh, five or six years, they've been self-sustaining. So we're not expecting so the country club to be a revenue generator. So there's no way we would be able to, you know, in a couple of years down the road, we're not expecting any revenue where we could cut the 30-year loan to less years. Um, resubmitting that back in you know there are other um, unique ideas we we had with the property there's some space on the property that's currently not being utilized for the golf course wooded areas some holes that have grown over we're hoping to find some additional revenue options that will help make it a lot easier to make it a self-sustaining course but um, I, I don't anticipate such revenue in such a large extent that it would reduce the borrowing I think as it was okay. talked about a little bit the only thing that would really be able to reduce that borrowing offset it is we do have some very, some very large, um, you know, projects that are currently in development um, in our, you know, our mixed use zones, which would generate a significant amount of revenue. Um, that would be a decision the town would have to make if they wanted to divert some of that towards the golf course to reduce the borrowing. Um, th that is a potential that hasn't really been talked about too much, but it's something that so could be considered. There was mention about, okay, so the golf course part, the golf hole part, the clubhouse part. But I live on that side of town, and that property down on Frost Road changed hands, what, two or three times as a restaurant and completely failed out. So since we're not a town of, you know, let's see, 35,000 like Chelmsford, mm -hmm. how do we intend to have a clientele to self-sustain or break even on this golf course? Right. Uh, has anybody done, okay. like, a study on Because it's a high-risk ind industry, high risk of failure. So how do we plan on making sure that we break even? So we don't know if we can break even. That's the honest truth. We don't know. Um, but we want to try. And if we do buy the golf course and, it, and if it's not breaking even and if we are losing money, then we could go back to the town and we could potentially sell, sell, the, sell the land off if, if we can't sustain it. But once we build on that, it's gone forever. Okay, so if you, you know, my thought is I want to try. I, I feel that it's a, it's a piece of property that's worth saving. Um, I think we have a lot of people, smart people in this town. I think we've brought a lot of revenue, and that's one of the slides that we were trying to show, that the projects that we have done on town um, over the past um, seven or eight years. We've taken uh, the Superfund site. And now we have a solar field. We, we collected uh, $700,000 in back taxes. Land that sat there with no revenue coming in for 30 years. But we got a solar field done. We collected $700,000 in back taxes. We, um, we have a revenue of, of $40,000 on that property. Um, Matt's done a lot of work. We have a, a piece of property on town that we're going to have a billboard. It's going to generate $200,000 a year. Uh, we've, we've looked at town-owned property and sold it, brought in $335,000 a year. We're, we're saying right now that this is going to cost the average tax bill $56. Do we try to, will we try to get that down to zero? Absolutely. But I can't promise you that. But okay. I can tell you what we have done already and, and show you examples of how well we've done in town, how we've taken this town in the, in the past eight years from $500,000 in our stabilization fund to come uh, uh, next annual town meeting in, in May, that, that number will be at $3.5 million. Um, okay. you know, and so we, we've increased our stabilization fund by $3 million. We're, we're heading in the right direction in so many ways. And again, with the projects proposed in town, additional revenue, I don't know. Until they're built and, and we're taxing these properties and the, and the money's coming in, we don't have it. But the plan is there. Um, and, and so, again, we have an opportunity to save it. If we don't, it goes away. And we, you, these 
opportunities come around once in a lifetime. Many years ago, I'll just finish with this. Not too long ago, but a few years back, the town had the opportunity to buy the Maris Brothers property, and we didn't. I don't know where that is. So the Maris Brothers is now where Innovation Academy is now. Okay. okay. So we didn't purchase that property. We could have done something with it. We could have bought it for several hundred thousand dollars. And now it, it's changed hands a couple of times. It, it went to Wang Towers. It went to BU. And now it went to a school. And it's a good school. It's a great school. It's a great opportunity for, for uh, people that are looking for um, an education that they provide. However, when that school was in Chelmsford, there wasn't many Tingsboro kids going to that school. Now that it's in Tingsboro and we send anywhere from 60 to 80 students there, that costs us about $1.2 million. So that was a missed opportunity. I see this as, as, as the same thing. Yes, it can bring in revenue, but if, that, if you want that small town character, if you want something to be proud of, you know, it, it has to be purchased, and, and then we can work on reducing the cost, which we're pretty good at. Okay, so all that aside, I do appreciate that you're yeah. being more forthcoming with background this time. Um, what, why does it have to be a golf course? If we're not expecting, if we're only expecting to break even or less, mm -hmm. me not being a golfer and not sure. going to hang out at the, the clubhouse, I have no use for it, but you want to take, you want to build on my tax bill mm -hmm. for something I would never use. Right. Why does it have to be a golf course? Some, Can't some it be people, like a dog park some or something? People, some people will use it as a golf course. Some people may use it for cross-country skiing. Some may, may want to bring their children or their grandchildren down on the hills and, and slide in the snow. But, but I it, thought that maybe, ruined the whole... Maybe there will be other recreational opportunities within that golf course. It just can't be if it's a residential land. So it, it, it's what, when you have something, again, I'll bring it up, that raw land... We, we saw the value of raw land. But then I want people to know that if that land has been improved by a golf course, but the only way you keep it that way is by maintaining it so that you run it as a golf course. That's what it's been there for 90 years and doing. So we just wanted to maintain the existing use. Not everybody will use it. Not everybody will use the old town hall. Not everybody will use the, the meeting house. But Maybe not everybody will use the senior center, but there's options there for our whole town to use. Maybe we have, we have uh, opportunities to use our fields at our schools, both at the high school and middle school and the elementary school. There's nice fields that even people go down there and they walk their dogs uh, around. So we're just cr trying to create things in town for people to use and go to. And, you know, we are trying to be transparent. Give, give every, all the details, some of the things might be figured out in the future, and, and some of the things we can figure out now. We really didn't have this under consideration until a few months ago, so we're still digging into this and figuring it out. Well, but we've done a lot, a, a lot of work on this in a short period of time. Well, I'm just also wondering about what Mrs. Puglio said last time, too, is because we have upcoming where we're going to need money for fire trucks or police cars or something that's going to be debt exclusions because we don't have any money left in the budget. Right. And then on top of it, you want to run a country club, right. which I can only foresee that you're going to ask for money up front in another debt exclusion in order to run it or get it up and running or keep it running. If that happens, which I don't think it will, but you're right, it could happen, but I don't think it will. I think we'll be able to, to manage this and, and make it self-sustaining. But if it isn't, we have the opportunity of selling it down the road. Okay, so do we have the opportunity to purchase it now, not as a country club, vote on that piece on what people want to do with it, whether it be a country club or just open space, or is, does it have to be purchased as a country club? On We're proposing to purchase it as a country club. That's, that's what our Warren article so is. So yes or no? So That's correct. So, so I mean, th there could be other proposals in the future. If if that gets voted down, 
I mean, we might not have an option on it. If the, if the owners decide to take it out of Chapter 61, pay the back taxes, which they'll have to do anyways when they sell the property, um, they could take the option, sit up, run it for another year, and town would not have the option. I, I, I stress, again, by history, we've had these opportunities in the past, and we did not take advantage of them. And we've ended up with parking lots on the mall, and we've ended up with innovative academy high schools or school systems that, that end up costing us a lot of money. Okay. Thank you. Hello, just to mirror his sentiments. Great presentation. You guys did a lot of work presenting it. Um, so my question was, um, 15 years ago we okayed CPC, which was a tax increase to everybody's taxes. Um, and Matt, you had mentioned that if we use CPC funds, mm -hmm. that's part of the funding of it, it has limitations. So is that due to the clubhouse? Because no. it's open. It, would be open space, but is it any, any, any land we purchase with um, CPC funds for the purpose of open, spa open space and recreation is supposed to have a conservation restriction put on it that it can only ever be used for that purpose in the future. So we can't buy it with CPC funds, say it's going to be open space, and then in five years, say the golf course isn't working out, we have to sell it for housing or we want to put a restaurant there. Okay, perfect. Thanks. All right. Looks like that's all the golf course. Yeah, sure. One more. Yeah, just, just a couple more comments. Um, wh when I looked at uh, the options that were presented, the 66 and oh, yeah. the 204 and all that kind of stuff, and then when you showed the Groton and the Chelmsford revenues and expenses, mm -hmm. do you know if those expenses that the town incurred mm -hmm. included debt? I. Let's see, Chumsford wouldn't have, Groton, I don't believe so. Okay, um, and, and the point is, Matt, if we're yeah, going no. to be transparent, as Rick says, then if you project revenues, according to the owners currently, of four hundred to $500,000 a year, and if your expenses are three or $400,000 a year, whatever they happen to be, you have to add in the 257000 a year as your debt payment. That's a cost of the purchase. Right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so yes. So that's part of the whole deal as to what this will cost on an annual basis. Right? Yeah, that, that, that's true. And, and, but th these, these revenues here don't depict the cost of the properties. Uh, th and, and we have right. put that out separate. Now, if, if we could get revenues back up to 500000 because you saw they, had, yep. they just yep. had their worst year at three twenty seven. Yep. Now, in the Trenford model, um, we would hire Sterling and potentially get thirty thousand dollars back. That you would probably put in a a um, a fund to run the golf course, uh, uh, just like we have on the ambulance and the sewer, an enterprise fund to run uh, to run the course. But if it did start bringing in five hundred thousand dollars of revenue and and the town profited a hundred thousand dollars a year, we could certainly take that money and pay down the debt. Be offset Absolutely. Be offset now another another thing, and this is where I say, we we we've done very well, but would bring in revenue into the town. So we haven't even talked about the eight acre parcel. So there's a vacant eight acre parcel for for those that that know the course and and as long as I have, that was the, that was the 10th, 11th, and 12th hole. Um, that's totally open space. We're, we're seeing, if we put this, another reason to, to go and do this as a debt exclusion and not use CPC money and be restricted to what we could do, but if we could find a, a company that would be willing to put a, a restaurant and a banquet facility like they have at Four Oaks or like they have at Tewksbury Country Club and we could generate revenue from leasing that land to them and make it uh, attractable for them to come in. That also could reduce the debt. Um, and, and absolutely, we try to do those things. Yeah, and I agree, Rick. My only point is if we're trying to sell town meeting right. on your idea, the town's idea, to move forward with a purchase for upwards of five, it may not be five million bucks, but whatever the purchase price is, there's a cost to borrowing money. 
and you're going to put it on a debt service schedule, and that's a cost to the town. Sure. Through the exemption, you're trying to get but an exemption of two hundred fifty thousand dollars more or less a year, in addition to the operating costs, right? So we'll couple those two expenses. So I, I think you just should, yeah, absolutely. Rick, so we all see we'll, what that we'll, cost will be. I, I would say we'll explain that and 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 show that there is. You know, we're talking about operating expenses and revenues on the golf course, and then we're also talking about the purchase of the land um, and, and what that will cost the right. taxpayers. Right, because whatever they're generating now, I assume, because they've been there for so long, they own the property outright. Right, and they, they don't have property costs. And, and actually, for those of you who know the owners, I mean, uh, uh, Glenn is out there probably from five o'clock in the morning till maybe dark uh, working that course. Um, so. That, that wouldn't be there uh, anymore, so that's why we would have to hire somebody, you know, in, in a company to run that. Um, so that's right. And, and again, their revenues went down significantly because, because once you tell yeah. people that you're selling the course, the leagues move to another spot, you know, people look for another place to play because they figure that course isn't going to be open anymore. The, the only other thing I'll suggest, just a recommendation that uh, to the board, if, if this passes, uh, my suggestion, Rick, because you have a lot of talent in this community, is that you probably ask residents to sit on a committee with you guys to talk about this. You've got professional real estate developers in town. You've got, I'm not volunteering, but you've got people with expertise in this type of arena. And the other thing I'd suggest is, if it goes forward, before you make any final deals, you get independent assessments, uh, one or two, from somebody who has no connection here, and just have them do the evaluation on the various options. I don't know if you've done that yet, but on the various options so that it's clean, other people are looking at it, people with no other interests, and they can say for 66 units and the town buying the rest of the property, it's worth $3.5 million, whatever. But anyway, that's just right. Thank, thanks, Bob. And, and that I'm glad you did bring that up because I think that would be uh, a topic that the board would, uh, selectmen would have a discussion on and consider as, as, as we have an enterprise fund and we have sewer commissioners, um, we have the police, I mean the fire department, I'm sorry, running the ambulance, uh, which is basically they're bringing in that rev revenue. We would also probably uh, have a, um, a golf course committee of, 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 like, as you say, qualified people to have that committee and, and, and do everything we can to to uh, maximize the revenues that that course could bring. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if this would help at all, but maybe another use for that empty lot you were talking about. You said it's eight acres? Yes. So that could be five lots that you could sell at your price of roughly 100000 So that's 500000 plus those two houses that are on the property is another 800,000. So that's like 1.3 million that could cut that could come off that up to you know whatever the assessed value is, 5 million, 4 million, I don't know what it is, but that could come off of that and at least stating that to the voters as options for reducing the debt so that the cuz I think what you're hearing is some people concerned about the um, tax tax impact knowing all the other things that are coming down the road but maybe identifying about 1.3 million that could come out of debt right away if we sold those properties. Sure. Absolutely a good suggestion, uh, you know, to do something with that property, that's one option. I, as I say, I, I'm, I'm very proud of the efforts that we put in to bring revenue into the town and, and the work that we put in uh, with the, all, the, all the various boards in town uh, to create our budget. Uh, the with selling the two houses and and if we potentially sold some of those lots um you know it, it might be good enough for a, a four house subdivision or, or that that they, somebody could put in there and those are prime lots overlooking the river they probably be worth a lot of money um and have have those houses on the golf course those are all good options we, but we have to buy the property first in order to make all those other things work. Uh, but and and as Bob said, and I agree, and uh, uh, th there's a lot of smart people in town, and I think we can figure it out. All right. I should have worn our 
golf polo tonight. That would have been good. All right, uh, everyone's good with the golf course now? Ready to move on? All right, great. Thank you for your questions and your feedback. This is going to help us going into town meeting. Okay, Article 7 is a zoning bylaw amendment to the mixed-use overlay district regarding to a clarification on inclusionary zoning uh, to add the underlined and bolded language. Uh, this article clarifies in the mixed-use overlay that the currently permitted projects located at 50 Westford Road and 150 Westford Road, also known as Flint's Corner, uh, which were permitted prior to the passage of the inclusionary zoning bylaw are not subject to the inclusionary zoning bylaw. Uh, and again, there's been a lot of talk about 50 Westford Road. At this point, uh, it looks like that would uh, affect both of the mixed use overlay projects, um, 50 Westford and 150 Westford Road. And I did just want to clarify because there's been a lot of uh, confusion about why this is coming forward and what it really means. And um, I just wanted to mentioned that this is really clarifying what we stated at the special town meeting in December. And just so you know, I'm not just making that up. This is an actual slide I pulled from the town meeting presentation. Uh, today, I went back and looked at the town meeting presentation. I highlighted it in red. The units already permitted will not be subject to the bylaw. We put it right in our presentation. I put the timestamp on here. If you go look at the video, we had our, our planner, Danielle Muccheroni at the time, um, talk about this, read this off, and mention that the currently permitted projects aren't going to be subject to the bylaw. It's only going to be future projects. The problem was it wasn't written into the bylaw. We said it, we put it in the PowerPoint, we thought that's what was going to happen, but it turns out it wasn't actually written in there that they'd be exempt. So what that means is these two projects that the town put a lot of time and effort into, into developing, into identifying areas outside of the residential neighborhoods that would be good for this type of mixed-use development, uh, blend of residential and commercial that's out of the neighborhoods, um, this puts those projects at risk because of a, a simple oversight, basically. So um, without boring you with all the details, the Tingsboro Commons project at 50 Westford Road uh, it's going to bring in significant permit fees, $1.6 million, about $2.5 million in sewer betterment fees, a traffic light, and then about $680,000 a year in property taxes. Um, so a lot of money up front, but also over 10 years, about $11 million. Um, Flint's Corner project is estimated to bring close to $300,000 in permit fees. That's great one-time revenue. We actually received a $2.5 million MassWorks grant, which was predicated on the town having a large development in that area. That was to widen the intersection, to get new streetlights, to get new sidewalks, to get better pedestrian uh, connectivity in that area. That project's going to bring over $500,000 a year in real estate taxes. Over the next 10 years, what, is, what do these two projects mean? about 16.7 to 19 million dollars in uh, revenue coming into the town of Tingsboro to go to so to go to some of the golf course considerations that we talked about I think we haven't really had this discussion but this is a lot of potential revenue that the town is planning on but hadn't earmarked for anything yet there's a lot of potential places it could go it could be the golf course it could be a public safety building the um, these all the numbers are one time except for the real estate tax revenues are based on 10-year projections so the 6.8 million is over 10 years and the 5.3 million is over 10 years. So it's basically 1.2 million dollars annually. No, that's uh, over 10 years. Yeah. The, uh, the annual tax contribution moving forward is about 1.2 million for the two projects. The first uh, two to three years during development, it's significantly higher. There's close to $2 million in permit fees well over $2 million in sewer betterments. The developers are contributing hundreds of thousands of dollars in additional infrastructure improvements. And um, um, yeah, so we've highlighted there about $11 million total investment over 10 years in Tingsboro Commons and $8 million for the Flint's Corner project. And um, basically what made these projects um, exciting to um, the builders is because the whole mixed use overlay aspect with that blending of residential and commercial allowed them to build market rate units. We had planned on those market rate units being built and our affordable housing planning. Um, since we're significantly over the 10% mark right now, um, at the 11, oh, over 11 percent actually, even with these units being built, we were still going to be above the 10 percent, so we felt comfortable um, with the current permitted projects being exempted and only new projects having to be included, but this one sentence in bold and underlined wasn't in there, and um, because those projects didn't have a shovel on the ground, um, 
it, it creates an issue for their financing, which is um, which could put them on hold or terminate them altogether. So there's a, there's a lot riding on this very small tweak to the language, um, and the board of selectmen hasn't officially taken a position on it yet. So I do want to do want to be clear with that. They're expected, I think, to take a position probably before town meeting. Um, we've really been trying to look into the potential ramifications of it. The board has before making a decision. Um, and so they're expected to make a, a decision the night of town meeting, their official recommendation. That's our understanding, correct. These two, yeah, these two projects likely, I would say highly likely, don't happen or don't happen for a very long time or projects that come back are much different and on a much smaller scale likely. Um, yeah. Uh, two, two items up here. Uh, if you look at the, um, the sewer betterment fee of almost, well, 2.45 uh, million. Uh, so the, there was a, a vote on the zoning board. Uh, they, they went for relief from the uh, inclusionary zoning and that, that failed. Uh, and Flint's Corner would have the, r the right to do the same thing, to go to the zoning board and ask for relief. Um, whether this uh, passes or not. Uh, so, if if the if the if we enforce an inclusionary zoning on the first project, um, we will probably face, and we've been talking to legal counsel, as and and we have several meetings, more meetings scheduled with them as they research this. What we could potentially lose, um, a, probably a large portion of that. 2.4 million. It could go down to 300,000. That that sewer better. That sewer line is already in the ground. So that could that could potentially cost our town two million dollars if we were if we went to court and lost. Um, so we would that that's a, that's a, a gamble. Uh, if I move down to the Flint's corner, um, we have a 2.5 million dollar Mass Works grant potentially. If that project didn't go through, we could potentially lose that and have to pay that back. So that would have uh, a negative impact of of, uh, of probably just under five million dollars, um, you know, potentially on these. So th these are the figures that are out there, and and this is what we have potentially to lose. Um, not saying that we would lose either; maybe we might win, but there's risk involved. Um, they recommended four to one. Um, no, to re the oh, I'm sorry. No, the the planning board. Yeah, four to one. To rec yeah, yeah, to recommend the article. Because we've been talking to council, we want to know every angle that could possibly happen, but we'll take a vote before special town meeting on, on whether to recommend or not recommend. Pat, uh, yeah, if you could come up, Pat, please. Um, let, let's let's talk to each project individually. So we got Ting Tingsboro Commons and Flint Corner. So which one are you asking? Uh, on on the Flint Corner project, that's yes. where the road was expanded. Yes. On both sides. Why is the town going to be held liable? We don't know. We don't know if they will. Okay. So we don't. We don't know if we will. There's risk involved. So that Mass Works grant, it 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 has several aspects to it. So part of it is economic development. Some of it is is uh, creating uh, housing. Uh, w there's a whole different application uh, that that the town puts together, and and we actually score very high on these applications because of all the work that we've done. So, but part of that is that the the rec the residential get done. We that's a and we're improving the road. And we're improving the business, uh, the business uh, complex, 
that, that's in there doing improvements to that. That all went into the application. So if, if we come in and say, if the builder comes in and says, I'm not building it because now he has to do a lot of improvements. They're doing $500,000 in, in, uh, in water permit uh, connection fees. They're doing a, a million dollar upgrade to the sewer line, 800 to a million dollar upgrade in the sewer line. Now if we throw inclusionary zoning on top of that, it becomes an unaffordable for them to do and they may walk away. Um, the original builder um, has backed down and now is selling the project in, in, to potentially other builders, and that's where it's at now, but the original builder is not in the picture as of now. But still, you're, you've made it sound like we're gonna be held liable. No, I, I did not, I did not say that. If you listen to me carefully, I said potentially. I never said we are. Okay, I said so. potentially there's a risk involved in losing that. I don't know if we are, and I don't know either way. I just wanted people to know that there's a risk involved. But the voters, um, no matter what, we end up voting just say to put this project in and give them all the little things they need to make it work for them. We're going to end up with more impact on the town, especially when more housing comes in, because housing seems to be the problem here. Correct? Well, oh, wait, Pat, wait, 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 wait. I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I'm not going to debate you on this. I can just say that I disagree that at that bottom number, if, if $19,000 uh, coming into town, I do not think that that will negatively impact our town at all. And I, I would have to, uh, I mean, financially, it will not negatively impact our town. Okay, thank you. That, Ed Smith, 39 Bowers Ave. Um, well, first, I, I'm just curious why on this article you're putting both parts. Because this article mainly is just a 50 West Road. It really doesn't include Flint's Corner. No, it, so, it, so it does. Our original. Well, well, we, let, me, let me just finish, Matt. Excuse me. Oh, but, yeah, that's a question. But just like Rick had just mentioned, Flint's Corner can come to ZBA for an extension, correct? correct? Right. And they'd be granted because the plan they brought for us is a plan they want to develop. So I don't, don't see any problem with that. And. Okay. Why is this not listed as a citizen's petition? Because when you and I had a discussion, Matt, you said that um, Trammell Crow brought this before you and you guys wrote it right. because you didn't have time to go to the planning board. So right. why, so basically this is a citizen's petition for 50 Western Road, but you're listing it as sure. a bylaw. Sure, no, so. But, you, you know, let me just finish. Uh, it's the but same every, question every, I can't answer I know, now. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But, but usually, <laughs> okay, yeah, usually every one article says citizen's petition. Sure. I'd like, like to know why this does not say citizen's petition. Sure. Okay, um, do you want me to answer that one first? Go okay, ahead. so th there, there is a reason why it's not listed as a citizen petition. Certainly, um, citizen petitions are typically items that um, the town is, is not associated with or we really, I would say, didn't want to bring forward. The, the most appropriate way for something to come forward is through the Board of Selectmen or the Planning Board process. They did bring this issue to us. I think we were, you know, we've tried to make that pretty clear how this was um, was brought up and developed. The problem with a citizen petition is once they they fill that out privately, they go collect signatures and they file it with the town clerk and she certifies it. Once that comes to us, we have no ability to change it or provide any feedback on it. We have to pr we have to print it in the warrant exactly as it's written. And whereas if they say, I have an issue with zoning, this is how a lot of our zoning changes come up. We have an issue with zoning. I'd like the planning board to consider it. The planning board considered it. We, I sat down with them. Um, Tom sat down with them. We, we, the town voluntarily made some changes that actually they, they didn't like, but we amended this to make it more friendly to what we wanted. Specifically, they were thinking of bringing a citizen's petition forward, and they said, we're going to bring a citizen petition forward that says the mixed-use overlay is exempt from the bylaw. And I said, well, g give us what you're, what you're thinking of submitting. And we changed this language so it was clear that it was only the prior permitted projects are exempt because that's the reference that we made at town meeting. And I don't want every project in the future to be exempt from the mixed-use overlay like their citizen petition would have said because if these projects go away or a new one comes up in five or ten years that we hadn't permitted and we hadn't planned on, we do want it to qualify. So this bylaw you're seeing is what, what happens organically when you bring an issue to us and we then bring it forward to the people. 
Right, but on this one specifically, it says this is for 50 Westwood Road and 150 Westwood Road, Flint's so, Corner. Right, that was so your you're first basically you're lumping, it, you're lumping 150 Westwood Road, Flint's Corner, into this Warren article okay. to say to people, we're going to lose them both. Oh, I'll answer your question. It was a question. Let me answer. Yeah. There's a question. All right. When this article was first brought to our attention, first started to be discussed by the planning board two or three months ago, we were planning on Flint's Corner getting a shovel on the ground within the next couple weeks, couple months. They had the first pre-construction meeting. If they got a shovel on the ground by November 2nd, that project would have met the, the one-year deadline. They would have been exempt. The problem is because that developer is in the middle of selling the project and changing hands, they didn't get their shovel on the ground. So now they're in the same exact predicament that Tingsboro Commons is in where they've missed that one-year deadline which wasn't written into the bylaw. So now they're both, now they're both subject to it. Um, we, weren't, you know, we weren't planning on that a couple months ago, but that's, that's a fact of life now. Both projects are in the same bucket. Certainly the Flint's Corner project could come to you, the zoning board, for um, relief, but they're going to be basing that relief on the same premises that Tingsboro Commons failed on. It's not to say maybe they couldn't get a variance, but the zoning board isn't voting on whether they like the project or not. They're voting on whether both of these projects would qualify for an exemption to inclusionary zoning. It's not whether you guys like the project or not. No, it's not whether we like the project. It's what was sold to town, the people at the town meeting. That's what, that's what the thing is. Well, that's what, what you sold. voted on, but that's right. not but what also, they would be going but, for. But also, too, like we, you're talking about, you know, shovel ready. You, I mean, you could po possibly include the construction that's going on there now as part of the project. It could be argued. That would be that would be it for an attorney and, and, and a, a good, bank, and a good lawyer would win that argument. We all know that a good lawyer would win that but, argument. You no, know, the, the issue with this is both of these developments. They're they're spending thirty and fifty million dollars respectively, and the the people financing these projects don't like to invest that money on. Hey, we think we'll win if we get sued. I mean, fifty, thirty, and fifty million dollars is not a small right. amount of money. But uh, as as we stated, it it's just there's risk involved. That's all we all we stated. And I said, I said right in the beginning that, that actually the Flint's Corner could, um, could go and ask for relief from the zoning board. I said that right up front. But we, we don't know what would ever happen in court. And, and a, a good lawyer does not win every case, I can, also, I, I can tell you. We don't know what's happened. And we just simply stated, I'm not saying one way or another. I'm just saying there's risk involved. That's right. all. That's what's up there. Um, and... But what we're voting on here is, is inclusionary zoning, not the merits of the project, just whether we want to put in what we said at town meeting a year ago, whether we want to rewrite that as we stated at last meeting. So it's all about inclusionary zoning, but not the merits of the project. Right. It, it is the merits of the project, because what happens is if they pass that article, then you're giving the planning board the ability on that project. And we all know with the plan, we've asked them, what's a, minor, what's a major modification? And every, every modification they've ever made is, is minor. So now we're going to go from three apartment, um, excuse me, six apartment buildings with retail and all commercial to basically three apartment buildings and no retail. And I know they're coming back, oh, we got somebody that might do retail. But I mean, I have a picture here. I mean, if this, is, this, this cracks me up. You know, three weeks ago, four, excuse me, four weeks ago, conservation. This is the plan they brought. I wish I could put this on the screen. This is the map they gave me. There's no... What project are you talking about, Ed? Uh, the one right up there on the screen. Which one? 50 Westwood Road. 50 Westwood. Okay, now, there's, there, the there's two up there. All right. Yeah, 50 Westwood. Now, there's okay. the plan right there. They brought the conservation. If anybody wants to see it. On the front, there is no commercial at all whatsoever. This is the plan they brought the conservation. They said to us, you know, they wanted to change, they wanted to keep the same notice of intent without having to refile because they said, well, not as less impervious surface because there's not as many buildings, and we asked them, well, I asked them, well, where's the commercial? Well, we're mainly a residential. We, you know, the commercial will come later on in time. I'm like, okay. Then at the next ZBA meeting, two weeks later, they said, that they had, they had a new map with a couple of buildings there. They said, yeah, we might have a commercial building now. Like, where's the map you had last week with conservation? Oh, we don't have that one anymore. So, so they you, keep saying So you to did us, well. You, you actually did well. You made, you well, made well, them add well, well, no, but, but commercial then, into it then, but the, but if they that was change, the case. But, right, but, but that's the, we tried to get them to commit to those commercial, but they won't commit. They, okay. th then they said in three and a half years, well, so, we're going so to sell more again, This is on inclusionary zoning. Yes. And then the other things can be brought up at, at, at planning board if it gets to that point. Right. I don't know if it'll get to that point. Well, me, I, I personally hope it doesn't. Okay.
Joe Poland, 22 Sequoia Zoning. There's two things that you're addressing here. One of them is, I don't know if you've caught it or not, uh, these you're trying to base two projects on the timeliness of them. So law-wise, the way the law was written, if they exceeded the time limit, they would have to reapply. If they have to reapply, we have to go by our current inclusionary zoning. Another topic was if the process during that time, if they had substantial changes, which 50 Westford Road has substantial changes, number of buildings, layout, where they're located, okay, they would also have to be in, follow the inclusionary zoning bylaw. Now, one thing that I, I you got a lot of great numbers up here. We're going to make a lot of money, a ton of money, right, with no impact to the town with that many units. N nowhere are you telling me how many units are going into now this Tingsboro Commons. They have the ability to add more housing on that parcel for affordable. You're not telling me where we are today with our 10% and when these condos go in and the apartments go in, how that's going to affect my 10%. Because guess what? As soon as we drop down that 10%, we're going to have another XYZ builder jamming in houses down in your neighborhood. Joe, okay. I did, I did we're going to have another that. 40B. I don't know if you mentioned it. Right now, we're above our 10%. Here? Okay, we're, we're above the 10%. We want to maintain <laughs> that amount. So we want to actually slow. I believe that the, the original intent was to get up to our 10% for affordable and then slow this down. But this with, is not slowing it down. So with, it, so with inclusionary, well, with our, our uh, affordable housing plan, that we have approved. There's several factors, just not the 10%. We could have 10% affordable housing in town and not have an affordable housing plan. Somebody could come in and say, well, yeah, they're at 10%, but they don't have a plan, and they would be right. They could go to the state and, and, uh, and, and appeal if, if, we weren't, if we weren't gonna permit them. The other things that we have is we also, before we reach 10%, we had the affordable housing plan, and we were growing at half a percent a year. So we were in safe harbor. We did a lot of work. I've worked on this since my first year on the Board of Selectmen. That was the first thing I did. And we're, we're now renewing our affordable housing plan, that, the first one that we did. So, there's, so what, what we've come up with numbers that even if these two projects get built, that we will still be over 10%. Uh, and, and then there has to be a plan in place to keep that. Right now, we don't have any affordable housing building uh, that has been uh, proposed to the town, none. That's, I mean, I, I agree as we, as we go on, but now we can be choosy. We've already denied two projects, right? We've already stopped two affordable housing uh, um, plans in town. Okay, we had one at Warden Road, and we had one at the corner of Frost and Lakeview. We denied both those projects uh, because they, were, they weren't right for the town. So there, there's, there's opportunity here. Um, you know, when, if we have revenue coming in, and again, that's, it's if. I know, I know it, it looks great. I, I'd love to see it because we could take this revenue and improve our roads. We could take this revenue and we could put it into... Uh, our affordable trust. There's nothing to say when people say, "Well, yeah, if they put a hundred thousand dollars in, we have to, we can't build it because it costs us too much money because um, we have to pay prevailing wage." It's not really, not necessarily true. Any private builder can come to our town and apply for CPC money or money from our trust, and and they could build it and sell it to us where we're not paying paying that rate. So again, there's things that we can do. Um, and, and I'll say that, you know, we, we have a great administration. Uh, uh, we have very smart people in town with our boards. We're all trying to work together here and do what's best for our town. Everybody here, I, I look around, I see the hours that we put into this town. And it's not for nothing. It, it, and I, I really believe that we're going in a good direction. I, I wouldn't be standing up here and putting all this time in if I didn't believe in our town and, and, and feel that we're going the right way. Um, so, did you, Joe, did I answer your question? 
you did try you to. Okay, but if I you have, I, you try to, but I don't have the, I don't have the numbers that that you proposed that that this was. So not we're take us we're under currently 10%. at eleven percent, right? And and if if these were at full build out, which, see, these probably won't be at full build out before the next census comes out. But even if they were, it wouldn't put us under the ten percent. But the the town has to remember that this will set the precedent for those other two developments that didn't go through that were told that the, you know, that wasn't, wasn't a right what, one of the a, town. If they wanted to come back, one of them, anybody can sue anybody. So days. one of those developments, Warden Road, yep. um, that, that already, they just built two houses on it. Yep. So that's done. And the other one, I wouldn't worry about that one. There, there, there's houses on there that are under foreclosure. They're moved. He was combining. He wanted to buy four different properties and combine them all into one. It's not happening. Okay. So, so my concern was setting the precedent going forward. The other thing is putting this back on the town. When was the last time, and I know that we've got out of the business of building affordables, when was the last time we built our own affordables? So We don't do that. We, well, we will we accept had, money. We is, don't even put money towards units that are coming off affordable index. We have houses that come in every single year that end up coming back to the town. Hmm. The person that owns them, has, the, the town has 30 or 60, 90 days in order to make an offer on that property and hold it as affordable. Those are coming off the books. We have three to four to we five. We track to, those. We, we do track them, and they come off the books, and they no, go they back have, to market no, no. rate. Only go, one unit has ever come off the books. No, only no. I, I've got records going okay, back. Okay, Joe, I, I'm, I'm telling you right now, only they, one unit. They, have, they come now, before the zoning, and I've got the records. Right. And okay. those go back to market rate. They come off the affordable Joe, index. you're wrong. That's something we, that you, we, we, be, we take yeah, votes on the yeah, Board of Selectmen. Joe, we take votes on the board. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Were you finished? I, I shouldn't have done that. I saw, I apologize. You have the floor. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, so the, we, those units come up to us and, and, and we vote to waive our rights. Every one of those units, except for the very first one that was up in uh, um, Maple Ridge, that's the one that we lost. All the ones that have come up in Merrimack Landing have, have all come up and, and they, they've remained affordable. And now, that, those There's been were, more than one in Maple Ridge. How, so how many are you saying there are? How many units did you say we've lost? Four or five? All right, I'm, I'm gonna put that, Joe, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna put that on an agenda item for our next, uh, our next town meeting and we'll come in and look those. If you could forward those to Matt, because in, in, in my, you know, eight and a half years on the board, I've seen that one. And that project just got permitted at that time too. I mean, just got completed. But let, let me talk a little bit to that. So when now the way when affordable uh, houses come in, those are deeded in perpetuity. So they can't, they, that, that was a, all right, go ahead. Excuse me, uh, state law states, they can come off affordable and they do come off affordable. The difference between the market rate and the affordable rate then do, does go back to the town. So that does go into a fund. So that like loophole to see wasn't closed I'd, two years I'd ago. I'd like to see what, what the town is holding wasn't... in those funds or if it goes into the general fund. Are yeah. they holding it for affordable housing or where is it going into? The, so the, so we, created, we, we created at town meeting, we, we created a fund that that money goes to. And we have to, um, now we have to create um, a committee right to run that fund right so that that money is in there and it can only be used for affordable housing uh, but i i believe that loophole was closed that now they have to be deeded in perpetuity okay hi adriana umbach is chair of the zoning board um i I view both of these projects as here because we have the inclusionary zoning bylaw and we voted against the, the variance. My question is more, um, what is the town's opinion on asking these developers, because of our concern of the 10%, maybe they don't reach the threshold, maybe this gets passed, of voluntarily putting some units into our housing stock that are affordable. So I think ours is 15%. Maybe it doesn't have to be 15%. If this does pass, can we say or ask the developer to put 
four or five because the census is coming up in about two years time and I don't know what the census numbers look like I don't know how many units have come online between 2010 and 2020 and where we are with the housing plan I'll put that I'll put that on here it should have been in here. we've circulated that to the Board of Selectmen and Planning Board let me just let me finish if I could and um, including our new growth numbers and our projections for the 2020 census and including um, the plans for these projects we would still be above the 10% um, but we can we can circulate that but information that's, to that's you that's for and, 2020 yeah. if, if these projects go in and other other large parcels which we know are going to go over the next mm -hmm. 15 or 12 years by the time the 2030 census we are trying to project out to the future mm -hmm. so we're never in a position to be forced into another 40b we can selectively right. choose the housing that we want to come into this town right. and if we can keep our threshold at 11 or 12 or 13 percent or and incrementally e increase it with every project that gets approved mm -hmm. we're in a better position to say to a 40b developer that's not that what this town needs or wants sure. hang so. on we'd have to wait before the selectmen come up with the plan for affordable so they have to update that plan. That, uh, two meetings ago, planning board, if you look back in your record, that was proposed to the developer for 50. Can you meet us halfway? Can you give us some affordable index? I believe you had, had to step out for a personal, right. you, you weren't there. But Matt, you were there, and we asked that, and, and we got a, a clear and definite no. Correct. We're not going to be able to do that at all. I've, I've asked even partially. I've asked board. both both developments, and and um, the answer that I've got is because of we'll go to uh, town commons. You know the high cost of the betterments um, in Flint's Corner. Uh, again, they have to pay a uh, uh, million dollar upgrade to the sewer system and five hundred thousand to the water department and connection fees. It just it just made it. But I did ask, and and that doesn't mean that we can't continue to negotiate that. But I also want to, when we were talking about future planning, when that, when that census comes out, and these, this census is every 10 years, so if, if we're at 10% um, at, in 2020, then we're good until 2030. So, so we have 10 years to plan that out. But, we, but it doesn't change. That, that number, once we get that number in 2020, that, that carries out for 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing, too, if there was, and again, at this point, we've looked at the numbers. We'll continue to look at them. There's an, there is a, a significant concern there, especially given our current standing. We're working on the housing production plan. The other thing to consider is with $1.2 million in new tax revenue, if we were concerned that we needed a bigger buffer in our affordable housing trust, we could put a small 10% of that tax revenue, $120,000 a year. Town meeting could dedicate that towards the housing trust and store that away. And in 10 years, we could have a million dollars. You could do a very large project with that if you if you um, partner with other agencies and um, you know you wanted additional funding. You should. I mean, the, yeah, the word "shouldn't" is true. You shouldn't have to. I'm just saying it's another option. There are a lot of ways to to cut the cake. That's all. I don't disagree that we shouldn't have to. Hi, Matt. Um, Hi. Can you pull up that slide that you had it? town meeting from before yeah okay so um that town meeting was over a year ago right it was in December uh, December yeah, of 2017. So it's about a year so if they didn't break ground in uh, a year why are we even cut number break you know um, that Tingsboro Commons project the town's not getting what it originally got sold it was supposed to be mixed use retail uh, it was a display just like that the original developer mm -hmm. brought up and it was like a colonial similar to uh, Pond View Place it was uh, two bedroom condos own occupied um, we already have apartment buildings there the original project was 192 mm -hmm. units of residential retail commercial yeah. maybe some industrial you touch it? right so um so there, there is still a retail and commercial industrial component. That's one of the things the planning board has been working to negotiate recently with the developer. Um, I know Ed disagrees because he saw a plan without it, but um, that, that is still part of the plan. Um, again, we could, we could talk about this, and definitely I know there's been a lot of discussion kind of out in the community about the very original plan um, as well, you know, bringing them to where they are today. Um, the developer, you know, I don't think they're here tonight. They can speak at town meeting. They've been trying to develop the property for eight years. 
um, approximately 450 Westford Road, the Tingsboro Commons project. Nobody else could get it done. Tramwell Crow is a big national developer. They have a plan that they can get it done. Um, it's a change. They need a special permit change. They haven't been in the project for eight years. They just came um, sometime um, within, the past, within the past year. So uh, and they would like to get started and have the building done within two years. So um, We already right. had a special town, a town meeting right. zoning change for that project, mm -hmm. like in 2012, 2013. Right. I'm saying if you're waiting for that original project to be done, it will never be built. So, I mean, then that's your choice. I don't get a vote at town meeting. Right. Right. That's basically what it is. Again, ju ju just to be clarified, when I, just if I could just finish, when we brought this to town meeting last year and you all voted to approve it, yeah. we told you these projects were exempt. I didn't say that nobody said, if I could just finish, yeah. nobody said they were exempt and if they don't get a shovel in the ground in 12 months, this goes away. Nobody in this room knew that at this time. But now we're all saying, well, they didn't get it built. Nobody that was part that. of the bylaw, how it was written. No it was, not, no, it was not. If it was a substantial change, which what they have, right, they had to change hands and change the project, that is in the law. So that, now, when it hasn't been Now, I want yet, everybody to also know that, that legal action the from the person that's buying 50, they're taking legal action against the town. They should know that. So, so these people that want to play ball with us are now going to be potentially suing us or taking this through legal action. So everybody should know that also. Yeah, the zoning board's been called out legally right now on a lawsuit because we voted against this project is what they're doing. Why are we even entertaining this now? Because it's in the hands of lawyers. This is wrong. All the, what we're seeing, the, the boards that have put a lot of time in this, we're somewhat seeing a little bit of a back door on the planning board end. We don't like it. And now we're being sued, the town. It's Rick, you know. Eddie reached out to you. The zoning board's being sued. I'm not going to interrupt. I'm going to wait okay. till you're done. So I don't think this is right the way it's going. This is supposed to be commercially built and residentially. I understand that. They came to us numerous times and said, we are not. Remember this, people. We are not in the business of building commercial. We are a residential builder only. They said last week again, we're trying to sell the commercial end. There's no guarantee. There's no guarantee in writing you're going to get those three front buildings built. Impossible. Because they're not selling. It's not going to happen. And what they're going to do down the road is they're going to come back in and ask for more residential on the town. And you know it's going to be a bigger burden. Because the usage of people... Mm -hmm. That's what's going to happen. We're eating up all our commercial space for residential. We're taking all of it, industrial. So, oh, let's put some more apartments in. That's what we're going to have a town that's going to be naked city, full of apartments, and basically screw the commercial in. And the taxpayer is going to pay for it. If you don't live in town, you don't have a problem. But the people that live here are going to have a problem because the money's going to come from somewhere. And the biggest burden in the town is bringing more residential into it. It costs more to operate. It's going to cost more in fire. Just tone it down a little. That's all. Police, all the utilities, it's going to cost more. Instead of sending an ambulance, you're going to need another ambulance, the more apartments you put in. Then you're going to have a fire truck following that because that's what happens. Correct, Doug? We don't just send a fire an ambulance. We send police. We send fire. So now we have a fire somewhere, and we have that fire truck tied up. It's a big cost in the town, and it's all about apartments because there's no other place to put them. That's the bottom line. Can't put them in Lowell. There's no room. Can't put them in Westford. There's no room. We're right in the middle. You're going to eat us up, and you're going to sell us down the tube to apartments. What about all the people originally that had acre-and-a-half zoning? Now it's down to what? Postage stamp? You think that's fair? I don't. I have it next Zoning morning. hasn't changed, Pat. It's still oh, an acre Rick. and a half. Rick. It's still an acre and a half. Can I start to answer something? I know something? it is, I'm going to forget everything you said. I'm not going to be able to remember. Rick, we're getting eaten up here. Rick, Rick, one more thing. One more thing. I hate to beat you up. But, sure. You know, sure. You're it's chasing okay. $19 million, but that, that's going to be coming into the town. So can you tell us how much our tax rate is going to go down now because of this new revenue? So, is, is it oh, ever going to go down? Joe, um, 
Our, our, our tax rate will be consistent with the other 350 towns because nobody's tax rate goes down in this state. Nobody's, right? We're, we're, not, we're, we're not different than any other community. But you know what? There is, more, there is more space in Lowell. There is more space in Westford. There is more space in Chelmsford. All those towns are growing. One of the things, Pat, is we, you'll say that that'll end up being more residential. There actually will, if there'll be zero residential. And, and, and maybe I know you might like that, but the, but the, the tax revenue just won't be the same with, with um, business versus that residential. Hold on, let me, I didn't interrupt you. So um, I have yet to see when, when we have business to change it to residential zone. We've done a couple of mixed use overlays so to, to maximize the area and bring more revenue in, but we haven't changed industrial or business and that's and I definitely don't want to see that we did a sewer extension and we stood up and said hey this sewer extension is to bring sewer and infrastructure into the business and industrial land that's in the northern part of our town and I, I won't I won't want to see any residential go up there I'll fight that tooth and nail but these projects here were already permitted they're already permanent. Now, you might ask, okay, how come did Tingsboro Commons? They, and, and you're right, there is, there, there's a potential lawsuit. It, it may happen, it may not. It depends on how we vote on this. Um, and, and you can't, hold on, hold on, I'm, I did not interrupt you and you had, you had a lot to say. Okay, so, so they, so these town, these, these, play, these, project there's a, there's owners of these properties they pay taxes they have a right to do certain thing on their land so when if we can't really talk about a lawsuit it's executive session but there is some things that we can say uh, of that's public information all right the builders have have put it out there that they actually had four different projects um, that that came in and they went and presented those projects for financing. They got all turned down, and it's not our problem, but it's a fact. This is what they will argue when they when they file a suit. They'll say, "Listen, we we had four projects permitted uh, that that went to the banks, and the banks didn't lend the money. They have the paperwork to back that up, and and they they would present that in a lawsuit. So now they, they asked another builder to come in, and they said, yes, we can do it. However, we can't do it on five buildings. We would have to do it on three to reduce the cost, and we can make the numbers work. That's where, we are, that's where we're at today. But then after that, if we say, but now we want to have inclusionary zoning, well, that makes another cost to the project that now, a project that was tight to begin with, now doesn't get built. And again, some people are fine with that. They don't want it built. Um, I don't want lawsuits in our town. Um, it, it's, it's just not good for us. We have the, always have the risk of losing a lawsuit. Um, I don't want that. Um, I, I don't know what else I can say. I'm not necessarily opposed to both of these projects. What my, what my concern is, is again, back to that 10%. We have to be smart over the next 15 years because the inclusionary zoning bylaw only applies to projects that come in front of a board for a variance or a special permit. If a farm goes in this town and they need nothing for a permit or nothing for a variance, a 60 acre lot, I, I know of one that may come up, it could blow that 10% out of the water. You can build without a variance, without the inclusionary zoning bylaw hit you, and then by 2030, because we're looking at the long term here, you're going to be hit with a 9% or an 8% number on your affordable. And then it opens up 40B, and then we're trying to get housing plans, and we're trying to get safe harbors, and we're trying to do all of these <coughs> things. If we can do these projects smartly and get a percentage and secure our growth, both residential and commercial, I think they're good projects. The Flint's Corner, I believe, has a commercial portion of it. I'm not sure where that uh, is. They both do, yeah. Yeah. And we are going to see, I think, improvement to the existing Flint's Corner Plaza plus another plaza. Correct. But these two projects, straight, without any consideration of what it's going to do to our numbers, and I understand we're, we're at 11% and these two won't throw us below, 
but if any of the big farms go, or if the golf course gets built, or any of those things happen, I'm not concerned about 2020, I'm concerned about 2030. Right. And that's where we're gonna end up with another 40B project in the town, in a, up on Middlesex Road, by, right by the mall type of, of condominiums. So again, I state the same. If, if these two projects are willing to, to get us to that point where we can pad our numbers, we're gonna be in a better position in the long-term future of this town. And the commercial, I want people to understand the commercial tax base only works if there's a tenant in there. If there's no tenant in there, the taxes actually go down. Your taxes on a commercial property are based on what the revenue that the business is making, that the landlord is making. If the place gets built and it's empty, yeah, it it's better to have the residential tax base because you're not gonna have any commercial tax base. It's all a factor of how much the landlord is making is how much the town is gonna make. And unfortunately, if you look at the Outback Plaza, that's half empty. I mean, I can't, that's not being used for its best uses. Hopefully. Yeah, they're, yeah. Yeah, they're gonna be coming in front of the planning board very shortly for a nice renovation of that plaza. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's good points. That's why there has been a lot of talk about that and the, the uh, board of selectmen and the planning board um, have been doing planning about that and the, um, we are working on the housing production plan and um, even though it wouldn't be an issue by 2020, 2030 is definitely where we'd be looking. Um, we have numerous options in place, especially with a, a housing production plan in place to plan for that. We've got CPC funds. We have a couple hundred thousand dollar, dollars already in there for affordable housing. We have over a million dollars in CPC 1.2 in their free cash that tomorrow they could put towards affordable housing if we needed um, 10 units. And that would count towards 100 market rate homes. So by 2030, if we're planning appropriately, um, that shouldn't be a problem given where we are today as long as we continue to plan for it. Can I just ask for clarification? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Adriana, um, okay, so you, if we do these, we're still within the, we're still okay with the 10%. But what you were saying is like if a farm got bought, then suddenly we could get, we could uh, go under the 10%. But isn't all future developments over seven, that's what the inclusionary zoning is, is any development more than seven units has to build 12% affordable, right? I'm just trying to our, our, make sure our, I understand this. When we were writing the inclusionary zoning, the attorneys clarified that um, standard uh, subdivisions, I don't have the exact term, that don't require any type of special permissions, just like your, your Form A lots, um, would, not be, would not qualify for the inclusionary zoning. So what does that mean? That means if somebody just went in and bought up a farm of... Uh, by right housing. Without a special permit? Yeah. As long okay. as the project is fully by right. Yeah. Okay. So that 12% isn't for all developments greater than 7 That's why we actually made it a little bit higher than 10% to account for some of that. Some of okay. those projects, those singles and those doubles are a farm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Rick? I just have one question regarding the... the 55 and older housing projects do not count against that affordable housing, correct? If, uh, if somebody puts 100 units in a 55 plus, it doesn't, even if they do an affordable c component, it does not count against, I, I, I think the point it doesn't go to, to our affordable housing. I think the point you're trying to clarify is deed restricted 55 and over housing doesn't count towards our 10% inventory. So the houses that they would build uh, the, excuse me, the houses that they would build would count towards our overall housing inventory yep. that would lower us closer to 10%. But if they um, build deed restricted units that are 55 and plus, those no longer count. So our current developments count, but uh, for example, that 66, um, like the 66 houses for the Toll Brothers, if they built that small proposal, we would have to come up with six or seven units somewhere else. Um, to count because if they put six of them in deed restricted, they wouldn't count towards so our 10%. A whole bunch of different ways that we can be behind the eight ball with, if we, with the affordable housing well, with the 10%. Because well, the 10% looks like, 11% doesn't look like much to me. If as I, far as I'm, I don't know what yeah. the numbers are. It's probably a small number of homes that, that would put us over, that would tip us it, and expose us to sure. the kind of stuff that we that we were exposed to before with right. no control. So it's it's not for a couple of reasons because one, it goes 10 years at a time. So as long as we we qualify at the 2010 census, um, which is our plan to hit right now, we'd be good for the 10 years. So you can dip down and up it, um, within there, but they're, yeah, they're only counting and moving forward. 
right. the other thing to look at holistically, if I could just explain, the only, now that we've reached the 10%, and we talked about the 40Bs going away, the only large projects we're looking at right now as far as housing that are non-exempt are the two mixed-use overlay projects we've kind of counted on and we're talking about right now. We can't have any large 40Bs unless we want them to. And the golf course article specifically, that got pulled to 55 and over zoning, if I could finish. We were going to offer up an inclusionary zoning change at the same time. Um, since the 55 and over got pulled, the inclusionary zoning got pulled. If we bring forward a 55 and over overlay that would allow a 55 plus development, we would make some changes to the uh, inclusionary zoning bylaw that would require them to give us a payment in lieu so we could build those units. Because if they build them themselves as it's currently written, those wouldn't count. But the good thing to remember is there's no 55 and over zoning overlay on the table right now. So we can't have any more large 40Bs unless we want them. We're not going to have a golf course unless we add the overlay and make those additional provisions. So the town has a lot of control right now. Right now, but I see the 55 and older as a weakness for us. Right. If but we, we start have, promoting yeah. 55 and older, we could be behind the eight ball in a short period of time and we could have a whole bunch of growth and not be able to catch up in the 10 years because what we would get from them is not going to be enough for us to, right. to compensate. Yeah. But to clarify, there's no 55 and over on the table today. Correct. Because there's Nothing no zoning today, in place. But but in the future. Right. And when we were looking at the, for the future 55 and older, we were looking at, at actually uh, potentially in having the discussion, because it's not a Board of Selectmen decision, but, but considering when, they, when we do have these public meetings that they're, they're not on large parcels. So we, we would be looking something like an 8 to 10 house development that, that, would, um, that we would you know, name those as potential 55 and older. And that's to the benefit of the people that are looking for to stay in town and looking to downsize. That's, it, but we don't need to propose uh, 200 units. There was a question earlier asked in, uh, um, about how many, I think you asked it, Joe, um, how many, house, uh, how many uh, affordable housing have we built? We've built none. I mean, the, the housing authority is, is separate from the town of Tingsboro. It's, it comes under our name only, but you know we, we don't control that under our government. Now, they, they built four units at a very high cost. They own the units, but again, by, by using, uh, the, by them doing it and building it, it, do, it does, doesn't make sense for them to do it because it costs too much money. That's why I think in the future, we need to look at, at these housing trusts and that, that are out there that will come in and build those units at a lower cost for us or even private developers and then sell them back to us. Uh, it would be much cheaper that way and we could, we could identify areas and put, and I, I'm, I'm looking for affordable senior housing that, that would, that would um, count you know, through the uh, housing authority because it, do they fall under the same regs? So, I mean, if the housing authority, um, well, some of their stuff, I guess, is not all age restricted, right? Yeah, they can do, um, oh, they have, they can, yeah, they can build their housing different ways. Um, they can have different preferences. Um, but typically, right now, the new law is that the, the age restricted um, houses wouldn't count. Um, so, we, I mean, I don't yeah, think we would. Does that apply to the housing authority? I haven't had that well, specific I'm question well, posed. We can find out. Yeah, we can find out. Um, I know we're, we're um, really getting into this issue, but just one more thing to clarify about how close we are. If we're five or six homes over, I just want to clarify what that means. That's really 50 or 60 market rate homes coming online uh, all at once to make up for that, which would really be unprecedented unless you had something major in town, such as, like we said, if the entire 90 acres of the golf course got sold and turned into single, single lots, we're talking maybe 37 homes. If that happened tomorrow and none of those counted, none of them were affordable, we would have to come up with a way, um, we would have until 2030 to come up with a way to build a four unit apartment building with one affordable unit in it. That's 25%, all four of those counts count. That would save us from 40 market rate units being built. So when we say we've got five or six homes above the limit, that gives us a 50 or 60 home buffer, which is basically 90 acres of development in town. So it is a pretty big buffer, even though you think, oh, we only have four or five extra affordables. It's actually a lot when you consider how many single family homes would have to be built before you'd fall below that number. All right. All right. Um, ready to move on? 
Okay. Mixed use overlay. <laughs> we'll get through these last ones quickly. Those are the two big ones. Um, Article 8 is a zoning bylaw amendment for solar energy systems. So this article provides clarification to various sections of the Tingsboro zoning bylaw to facilitate the installation of solar energy systems, solar panels. Uh, this includes updates to the table of uses, definitions, accessory use regulations, intensity of use, dimensional requirements, and parking and loading area design and location, as well as the general standards. Um, what this basically means is, oh, I don't have it up on here. Um, it is printed in the workbook. Um, oh, I did not knock it open. Um, so if you have the workbook and you're looking at it, our bylaws were basically completely silent on solar panels, where they allowed, where they not allowed. And the state does not allow you to um, unreasonably restrict solar panel placement. Uh, we received a grant uh, through the Northern Middlesex Council of Governments for free technical assistance to help write best practices for solar zoning into our town bylaws. So they worked with the planning board over the past year to develop the regulations. Um, so there are now solar definitions um, throughout our bylaws. We now have a table of permitted uses for solar panels, roof mounted, ground mounted, large, small, um, for every zone in town. So it just clarifies where they're permitted by right, where they're permitted with a special permit, as well as what the definition of all these things are. Without this bylaw in place, it could be argued that they're not allowed, or it could be argued that certain solar uses aren't allowed because they're not written in the bylaw, but that would then conflict with state law that says you can't unreasonably regulate it. So there's a conflict by not having these definitions in your bylaw. Um, and so the, the, the bylaw was drafted to reflect really our, our best practices or what our current practices are. Right now, for example, we don't have anything in our bylaws, but the building department does permit roof-mounted solar um, just because it's a, a reasonable, good, good thing to do. Um, and yeah. Yeah, um, NIMCOG actually had a, a special, um, they managed the grant and they hired a technical assistance person whose only j job is uh, as, um, solar zoning, basically. So they know what's going on in communities yep. with solar power and all those. I see, yep. from what I'm reading that, the Select and Planning Board and the Planning Committee all went along with that? Yep, yep, correct. Um, yes. Japan zoning. Uh, can you read the actual article, please? I don't have it in front of me. Can you read um, um, I'm going to need to grab a copy. I was going to pull it up as a separate part. You have it? I'll just take it. I'm going to. So it's not going to read necessarily right like some of your other zoning articles. This is um, everywhere in our entire zoning bylaw where you needed to include a definition or something. There were multiple sections where um, new phrases or definitions were inserted. So. Um, it doesn't read as one section necessarily. And um, you know, if you don't have time to read it now, we can take the conversation offline too if you want to touch base but before town meeting with any questions. Joe and Zoning, uh, can you clarify what particular structures, I know it's probably in the article and I don't have time to read it, but does this clarify the height restriction Copy. on Sorry. just solar panels and how they're constructed or actual buildings and solar panels. So right now we have a, a height restriction of 26 feet, roughly, mm -hmm. on, from the median foundation up to the peak. Mm -hmm. Is this going to actually increase the height of structures in general, not just the ones with solar? Oh, How I, is this written, and what does it include specifically? Uh, the, 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 the intent is, um, and Dan Danielle could uh, explain this better. She was at all the meetings with the planning board as they worked through this. But this this article is 100% focused on zoning. There was no intent to um, increase other dimensional requirements that I'm aware of. But I, I can have Danielle maybe clarify with you. But as far as what structures are delineated, is it just the towers? Is it just the ground mounted? Or does it allow structures to exceed 26 feet, up to 100 feet? In order to mount yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to, I don't, I don't have it on my computer here. I couldn't access it, so. So, so height and feet shall be the vertical distance measured from the mean of the finished ground level adjoining the entire building 
at each exterior wall to the top of the highest roof beams or a flat roof or to the peak of the highest gable or slope of a hip roof. That's similar to the wording that we have currently now on zoning uh, bylaw. However, it restricts it to 26 feet from the mean to the peak. In all districts, uh, uh, structures including solar energy systems located upon the roof of a building may extend above the height limit, but in no case shall exceed 100 feet. So it says in all districts, structures including solar energy systems, okay. but it says structures, structures located uh, so, on the roof of a building, I, structures that have the roof of a building may extend above the height limit, but in no case shall exceed 100 feet. So does that mean that all structures after this comes through, whether they have solar or don't have solar, they're limited now to 100 feet? Are we gonna have high-rise apartments now? No, 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 so, so to clarify, this definition, every bit of those words, including the exceeding 100 feet in structures was already in the bylaws. So this isn't actually making a change to this. The only change in that section 2.12.49 is clarifying that including your solar energy system is included in that limit. We, the we, don't, have, there. we don't have buildings allowed for 100 feet in current zoning bylaw. Again, this is not changing the height of buildings. The, the only words that are being changed are those four words. So if a 100-foot building is not allowed in a zone, this would not allow a 100-foot building to be built. Um, that is not, and that would not be an accurate, accurate interpretation. But the solar structure can exceed up to 100 feet, not exceeding 100 feet. So it's gonna block out the sun to your neighbor? It's gonna, what's, what's, it gonna, what's it going to entail? This was just a chart. That, that covered all, all towns. We don't have, we have a height restriction, so we're not changing that. That's just placing them in a certain zone if, if there was. That one would not apply to our town. Rick, are you saying that this Article 212.49 does not apply to our town at all? Then why is it on here? Again, I yeah, I can't speak to why the rest of the bylaw is written that way, but the only change here is that it includes solar energy systems. Um, and again, that's a not to exceed amount. It could, uh, we'll get back to you with clarification on that. Um, I'll have the attorney who can probably explain it more eloquently than I can. Yeah. Does, does this mean I can't, if I go put solar on my house, the solar energy system off grid under 11.41, um, does that mean I can or cannot disconnect from National Grid if I so choose? The, well, this article just focuses on the building of it. Um, that's unlikely. Um, it, the whole idea of getting off National, national Grid, um, that's not really what this article is about. Um, well, I know. I, I just want to make sure that I preserve, preserve my choice if I so want to in the future. <laughs> are you wondering if this would limit your ability to go off-grid? Yes. Kind of? Um, I, want, well, I, don't, I don't think so. It doesn't read that way. Yeah. This puts but, uh, just reasonable restrictions oh, on it. Um, energy system in which there would be setback, you know, normal setback requirements and things like that. But you actually, you have a lot of extra space on your property. Most of that would be usable for a ground-mounted system. Um, Right. Depending on the size, if it was over 1,750 square feet, that would be a medium-sized system. So in an R1 zone, um, you would need a special permit. So it's an allowed use with a special permit, but the planning board would have to um, ensure that if it was an entire acre, it was you know, consistent with the neighborhood characteristics and it met setback requirements, things like that. But if I have more than enough room, why do I need a special permit? <laughs> Again, it... Um, Where, medium scale? What'd you say right here? R1 to, what's SBP, SPB? Uh, as an accessory use, medium scale. Is that what you mean? Yep. Oh, I don't have the, I don't have the definitions here. It's season R, I think that's actually, it looks like a typo there. I think that's meant to be a permitted use. Medium scale. There's a difference between per, uh, principal use or ground mounted uh, accessory use. I was looking at the principal use. Um, there's a more stringent standard for principal use. If it's just an accessory use, I believe that's meant to be permitted by right up to small and medium scale. It says R, not P, though. I believe that's just a typo. We might have to correct that. 
I can circle right, back so with you. I can have Danielle call you too, like to look at your lot specifically and, and things like that. Well, because I've thought about it, but I. <clears throat> so it would just be if it was just you're saying if it was like accessory to complement my national grid, then right. it would be a standard. Yeah, it's permit. it's it's easier to permit if you have a house and you want to put it down versus if you just own a residential lot. There's like a higher standard to build it as a primary use. It's it's easier if you have a home and you want to put oh, solar next to it. it. Yeah. I'm not on top of it. There's a difference between putting it on the uh, roof and putting it on next to it, on the ground. Not much. No. Um. The the bylaw is written so it's it's easier to build solar if it's on your roof or on the ground next to your house. Right. There's a higher standard if it's built on a vacant lot somewhere, which is not your oh, okay. not your case. I was reading the wrong section. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm gonna have Danielle present this one. At town meeting. She she wrote it with the consultant so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I think we answered. I, I think I just said oh, I'm gonna have the attorney get back to him. Was this for yeah solar? Hey, any more questions on that right now? We can certainly take it uh, offline as well. That's fine. Okay. Um, we have four sewer articles uh, approving an easement for a sewer pump station. This article would allow the sewer commission at, uh, to cross town owned land for the purpose of hooking up a sewer pump station on Parker Lane. This is on the corner of Parker and Frost. This is a six plus acre parcel we took for tax title in the 90s. It's sitting there vacant right now. Um, we would like to put a pump station on it as part of phase two because it's town owned, even though they're town body, they just need an easement. Um, so this was unanimously supported by everyone. All the boards are viewing it. Um, all right. To, uh, article 10 is an easement, <coughs> excuse me, a residential easement for a sewer connection. This article would allow a private parcel to connect to town sewer by connecting through an adjoining town owned parcel of land. They need to ca connect under a portion of the Lake you have fire station parking lot, but the easement itself has been, uh, is reviewed by the fire chief and having that easement there is not going to impact any fire operations in any way. Um, so again, those are the two sewer easements. Um, article 11 is the phase two I and I program. Uh, this article would allow the sewer commission to borrow up to $500,000 through the mass clean water trust for the second phase of the sewer inflow and infiltration program. This program is mandated by DEP to identify areas of I and I inflow and infiltration, uh, in the current sewer system. This f phase includes flow isolation and smoke testing with a final sewer system evaluation survey report presenting the results on the above. And this phase of the INI program will further identify areas of inflow and infiltration into the current sewer system so that repairs may be done to eliminate those issues. Uh, the sewer commission will be available uh, if you have any real specific questions on that, but it's a, it's a pretty straightforward program. Um, Article 12 is Flint's Corner Pump Station wet well upgrade. Uh, the Tingsboro Sewer Commission is requesting a transfer of $166,110 from the Sewer Enterprise Fund retained earnings so that the Sewer Enterprise Fund uh, to the Sewer Enterprise Fund fiscal year 19 budget capital line item. This transfer is needed to fund the remaining construction costs for the Flint's Corner Pump Station wet well upgrade. Uh, the construction on this project had significant delays due to the utility company. Uh, the contractor was unable to complete the majority of the work by June 30, 2018. Therefore, any of the remaining funds budgeted in fiscal year 18 for this project were closed out at the end of the fiscal year. So that's the reason for the request to finish the project. Uh, the project was already approved and started. So just a pretty simple funding issue. Uh, Article 13 is the acceptance of Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Section HA, to create a Commission on Disability. Um, most communities around here have a commission on disability. It's a simple acceptance of mass general law. The explanation is pretty simple as well. Uh, commission on disabilities, uh, establishing this commission will allow the town to promote the inclusion and integration of persons with disabilities in activities, services, and employment opportunities in the community. They also serve critical functions like advising local municipal authorities and ensuring compliance with federal and state disability laws, allow them, allow the town to allocate funds from handicapped parking fines to programs that benefit persons with disabilities and coordinate the activities of other local groups organized to meet the needs of persons with disabilities. So it's, it, that may sound a little repetitive. They have six um, 
specific charges in the statute, they're all related to basically advising the municipality on different ways to be more inclusive of people with disabilities. Um, so it will be a big help to our building commission who has to do a lot of this work uh, on, his, on his own right now. Uh, Article 14 is creating a compensated absence special revenue fund. I'm going to talk about 14 and 15 together because they're um, uh, related articles. 14 is the creation of a compensated absence special revenue fund, and Article 15 is a transfer from the compensated absence stabilization account. So that's the account that you're more familiar with, that we have money in, we add a little bit of money to it each year. So uh, the Department of Revenue has recommended that this stabilization fund that we have, as I referenced in Article 15, be converted into a special revenue fund so that the town would have a less cumbersome access to these funds if need be. For example, under the current structure, if a town employee were to retire mid-year, any accumulated benefits to be paid out and had accumulated benefits to be paid out, a special town meeting would need to be held and a two-thirds majority vote would be required just to access those funds mid-year. So it's really an impractical, impractical process. However, if we transfer these funds to a special revenue fund, which is their request, the town could immediately use the funds without, with the authorization of the chief executive officer, which in this case is the Board of Selectmen, for future payments of accrued liabilities for compensated absences, such as backlog of sick time, uh, due to the employee or full-time officer of the city of town upon termination of the employee's full-time officer's employment. So that's, that's a little legalese, but essentially if somebody retires, resigns, uh, whatnot, and they have uh, sick time that's due to them because of a contractual agreement, um, the Board of Selectmen would have the ability to access these funds without having to call a town meeting mid-year which I don't think anybody would really want to go to. <laughs> uh, so Article 15 is the simple transfer of the $190,000 we have in our compensated absence stabilization account into the new compensated absence uh, special revenue fund, which was created in the prior article. And besides the executive, besides the selectmen, does it require finance committee I think it's written. Um, I think it's written in the state law that it's just the chief executive officer. Sometimes they clarify who it is. Um, I'll double check though. Um, I'll double check. And Article 16 is just our annual prior unpaid bills article. Uh, we had five unpaid bills. As you know, we close uh, on June 30th, our fiscal year. Sometimes some bills slip through the cracks. So these are legitimate expenses. But because the prior fiscal year is closed, they need to be paid out of the current current year's budget appropriation. Uh, it does require a nine-tenths vote. Uh, we typically get a unanimous vote. Um, the vendors deserve to be paid. They provided the services to the town. Um, so that's it, 16 articles, two contentious ones. Yeah. Sorry? I'm sorry? Well, you guys asked all your questions, so you don't get to speak at town meeting now, right? <laughs> I didn't tell you the rule? I didn't. Ah, oh, all right, you're the only one, David. That's all right. That, yeah. That's all right. Ed, you owe us the 16 million if that article fails. I'm right, I'm taking it from your paycheck. I'm taking that 16 million from your stipend if this article fails. You're going to have to work for us for the next 3,000 years. Sure. So he'd like to, he'd like to tie into the sewer system. He'll pay tie-in fees to do that, and he'll pay for his sewer capacity. He's very close to the line. He just has to trans his line instead of just going from his property into the sewer. It has to pass under the parking lot that the town owns on Lakeview Ave. So um, it's not really a benefit or uh, a harm to the town to do that. It just happens to be his parcel. Our parcel is in front of his parcel. So yeah, it's. L legally, he doesn't want to put it there unless he has an easement. Because if he ever needs to fix it or something in the future, he has legal rights to maintain it. You know, maintain that access that line. Thanks, All right, thank you everyone for watching, and we look forward to seeing you next Tuesday at the elementary school. Thank you. Yeah, I said that correctly, right? Next Tuesday. Yeah. It will. You know, but yeah, some people work, they gotta feed the kids and...